Welcome to the first lecture of Machine Learning 1. Uh, my name is Eric Beckes, I'll be your teacher for this course and I'll be recording a lot of videos like these. And this is basically the first one. Um, so, well, let's get started with it. I thought it made sense to start off with explaining what we actually mean with the term machine learning. I mean, nowadays it seems that almost any algorithm that uses data of some sort is called a machine learning algorithm. Uh, for example, this often includes concepts we are used to to refer to simply as statistics. Um, so, well, let's, let's just start off by making precise what we mean with machine learning and we'll see that it is indeed a quite general term which we can break down into several subcategories. Now, this is a widely used definition of machine learning put forward by Tom Mitchell, who is a renowned researcher in the field. He wrote a book about it. Um, basically, this is what he had to say about it. Uh, a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience E. Okay, so this is a beautiful sentence, but it's very hard to parse. So let's just break it down into these three core components. First of all, a computer program is designed to perform some task T. Right, so we want to automate some pro pro process, and we call it this. Oh, sorry, we call this the task T. Right. Now, in this context of machine learning, such a task always comes equipped, or such an algorithm always comes equipped with a performance measure P, and this performance measure P is a way of quantifying how well uh, the algorithm is doing its job. Okay, and basically we want to optimize this performance measure. Then, how are we going to do this? We're going to do this with experience E. So this is, let's say, the most important notion of machine learning is the, the, the concept of experience E, which is used to improve my algorithm. And this improvement is measured by this performance measure P. Now this first example, it's uh, in the context of image analysis or uh, really converting handwritten digits, images of handwritten digits to the actual digits. Right, so the task is uh, looking at these images, they're already sorted here, but so if you look at the top row, these are all zeros, and we want to recognize that as being a zero. These are, these are ones, these are twos, uh, and so on. Right, so now experience comes in the form of labeled images. Uh, the experience is that someone uh, showed me an image like this one and said, this is a zero. Um, someone else wrote down this thing and said, this is a tree. Okay, so based on this experience, I'm going to improve an algorithm uh, that, that automates this task of digit classification. So this is a famous data set called the MNIST data set. You will encounter it throughout this course. So it consists of handwritten digits of size 28 by 28. Okay? Um, yeah, okay, so let, let's move to the, to the next uh, uh, topic. Now, now we're considering a different task, a different setting, and we're, we're considering actually the, the analysis of tumors. Um, why is this relevant? Um, well, uh, there's many types of tumors. Some are benign, some are malignant, so they are very harmful, and we want to treat them as soon as possible. And sometimes it's not really easy to see from the outside or from some some medical image scan, whether, what, what type of tumor it is. And we can actually, that is actually a way to determine, determine the type of tumor uh, more accurately. And that's by uh, looking at the expression of, of certain genes. So what we're looking at here is an expression matrix of genes. Um, or on the horizontal axis, we have the tumor types. Uh, so each column represents one tumor. So uh, for example, this one represents a, a breast tumor. Uh, this one represents uh, leukemia. Now on the uh, vertical axis, so each row represents a particular gene. And what this plot uh, really shows, it, it's a heat map. Or we can look, consider it as a heat map for activity of a gene. So when the color is green, uh, we basically say this gene is very active. Uh, if it's red, it's not particularly active. Um, what is actually measured is uh, messenger RNA. So this is a product, uh, a protein in all biological signal processing pipeline. Uh, 
and the genes basically describe a way of how to produce these uh, mRNAs. Um, but the point is, we are able to measure the activity of genes. And so now we can invent several tasks related to this data. And one of the maybe most obvious tasks is to automatically classify such a profile as belonging to one of the tumor classes. And what we see here, all this data, we can think of it as experience, right? So uh, let's take, for, for example, look at this particular profile. Uh, whenever we see a profile like this, uh, we might be tempted to say, oh, this is uh, a melanoma we're looking at. Why? Because, for example, you see a lot of green, so a lot of activity of this particular gene. So it encodes for small nuclei, I guess. Um, but experience tells us that whenever we see a pattern like this, uh, it's probably a melanoma. Right? So this kind of experience we're going to use uh, in maybe some other examples later on to automate uh, the process of labeling uh, samples into several tumor classes, as in this case. Now, this is a type of experience that maybe you can all relate to. It has to deal with uh, the classification of, uh, well, identification of spam in your mailbox. Um, so basically, again, experience in the form of data. And in this case, the data are, uh, well, sentences, it's text. So basically our experiences, for example, that we, um, well, whenever we see these sort of discount trigger phases, we're tempted to say, oh, this is spam. I don't care about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read it. And there's all these cues that from experience, we learned that, okay, uh, these are indicators of spam. So that's how we can look at the experience. And we can use this experience uh, to design or to improve automated algorithms. Okay, so that was focusing mostly on the experience part. Uh, now let's have a closer look at the, the task. Uh, so, right, a, a machine learning algorithm has to perform a particular task. And typically it, it relates to automating some process that we as humans are used to doing um, to, to a computerized format. For example, the task will be classification and classification means we have an input and we want to place it in some, some class. So if let, let's do it manually. I see a two over here. I see an eight over here. This is a zero. This is an eight or a nine. I don't know. Um, this could be an eight, could also be a nine. I'm not fully sure. But the point is we want to assign each image to one of the, the, the particular classes. And later on, actually, we'll, we will adopt a more probabilistic viewpoint. Um, meaning that sometimes we're not fully sure, like uh, in these cases, if we're looking at an eight or a nine, and then we want to assign probabilities, like uh, with some probability, this is an eight, and with some other probability, this is a nine. And then maybe later on, we can still make decisions based on these probabilities, but we have a notion of uncertainty. Okay, that, that's a task. Uh, so also for the spam identification, this is also a classification task. We want to classify the, the, the sentences as either spam or non-spam. So let's do it manually again. That's spam for sure. Okay, so um, machine learning is all uh, about automating these kind of processes. Um, well, not, not, not necessarily only about automatic processes, also to, for exploring data, but we'll see that later on. Okay, so we just covered one class of tests, namely classification, where the task was given this input, put it into one out of, let's say, n discrete classes. Uh, a different class of tests is that of regression. In this particular case, uh, we're looking at inputs, for example, this input x, and we want to map it to some corresponding value here on this vertical axis. So we want to find a function that maps this in input x to some, some value. And this value is no longer discrete. It can be any, it, it is a continuous thing. So anywhere on this vertical axis, we can, can place this target value. Um, so that's the main thing about regression task if that, that is that we're not mapping to just a discrete value, but to a continuous scale of values. And um, so when we talk about regression, we typically think of uh, function fitting. And in, in this case, um, so we'll use this ex example a lot during this talk. Uh, 
So we see this green line, let's think of it as a true signal. So uh, this green line is actually a sign to pi of x. So that's our ground truth sort of. Uh, but in reality we always have to measure things or uh, we have to deal with measurement errors, uh, measurement noise. So the things that we actually measure, like so these blue points, is actually this true signal with some epsilon noise, some random variable. And typically we, we model this with uh, a normal distribution, for example, with zero mean and unit variance. Um, yeah, so okay, the task is given an input x, map it to some continuous uh, output through some function f of x. And the goal is to find this function f of x. Now, again, if I would want to do this manually, then what I would probably do is define some class of functions, let's say polynomials. Polynomials, they have to form like f of x is some constant, w0, plus a weight 1 times x, plus a weight 2 times x squared, and so on, uh, up to some weight m times x to the power m. Uh, so I have some, some choices to make here. One, first of all, the order of, of the, the polynomial, and then I have to find um, well the optimal weights that make sure that this function comes close to my target value. Right, so I've measured these blue points. I've measured these blue points, and now I want to find a function that best fits through these uh, blue points. And green is the ground true reference that we actually want to recover, but we don't know it. Now, if I just pick a zero to order polynomial, then I'm really dealing with a straight line. So I can only tune this offset parameter and then this horizontal line is the best I can do. If I uh, go to a higher order, well, MS1, it's, I'm just adding this slope to it. So I'm looking at these two coefficients. So, so I'm tweaking these W values and I found that this is really the best I can do. And so this is, of course, a very tedious task to do manually, and we we'll want to automate this. Now, uh, when I go to higher order, maybe at some point, M is 3, I actually am able to do a pretty decent job. Uh, so this red curve seems to flow nicely through the data. So I'm quite satisfied with this. But of course, we can move it a bit to the extreme. So let's go to an order, M is 9, and then I get this extreme fit. Uh, but what you can see, it exactly moves to the data points. So these blue measured points, my red curve fits perfectly. So I was able to tune my W's such that I have a perfect fit basically on this data. Though it looks a bit wiggly and I'm not super satisfied with this, but given my data, I would say this is a, a pretty good fit. Okay, so we had the class of uh, classification. We have a class of task called regression. And then we also have clustering. Now clustering is also uh, a task of itself. And the idea is mostly to explore the data, to find structure in the data. Um, if we think about tumor classification, um, maybe we know that there, are, that there are different types of tumors. I'm not fully sure how many types, but one, some part of this subset of tumors are very harmful and some are not. And we want to sort of look which tumors are more closely related than others. And uh, you can do this by clustering methods. So uh, let's take a look at this data. So horizontal on this plot were all different tumor types. And if you now just select one of them, basically this activation pattern, we can represent it as an uh, n-dimensional vector. For the purpose of illustrating this, uh, we just assume that we have a way of reducing this n-dimensional vector to uh, a 2D point. Basically this 2D vector, a uh, vector of length 2, that's sort of a summarizing uh, vector of this n-dimensional vector. Uh, we, later we will see ways of actually learning how to do this mapping, but now we just assume that we have a way of representing each tumor with just uh, two values. Okay, so then we can fill in this plot on the right. So we have a lot of tumors measured. We all compute these 2D uh, summarizing coefficients, and we plot them, so one point, is one tumor. Now the, now the task is to explore if there are uh, patterns or if there are tumors that are related to each other. 
and we can do this via clustering. And let's just quick, quickly go over a, a way of doing this. Like we could do this by assigning each tumor. Let's say there are four classes. So we want to divide uh, all these tumors into four categories. So what we could initially do, we just randomly assign. So let's write it down. So randomly assign each xi to one of four classes. And that's what you do, what, you, what, you, what we show here. So each color represents one class, and then we have this nice colorful point cloud. Uh, what we can do next is just look at the mean uh, to the value, to the vector value of each class, uh, because that's sort of summarizing, well, what a tumor within this class looks like. So if we compute the mean over all the, the yellow points, it's probably located somewhere over here. It's close to the origin because it's so spread out. Um, if we look at the mean of the blue points, it's over here. Red, uh, green over here, red over here. So these crosses, which maybe you don't see too well, this, this is what I call the cluster means, mu i. Okay, what I can then do next, so basically these mu i's are a descriptor of my class of tumors. It's, uh, well, the, the average uh, vector value within that class. So what I can do is just look at, now again, I reiterate. So I look at all my points and I want to assign them to well the closest mu i. So the, the closer to which it looks most similar to. And what you then get is this partition over here because the centers were here, 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 and here. Um, okay, so now we have a new partition and we can, uh, of course, uh, reiterate uh, so, look for closest cluster, or actually maybe most similar cluster. Um, yeah, and then we so we compute the mean of each cluster. So we have a new mean over here, here and here. We iterate, and then we get this partition. And uh, so basically what this tells us, uh, we find a way of partitioning all my data into four classes. And uh, basically we, we are now able to say if a, if a new point comes in, for example, this one, it's closest to the yellow class. So uh, we know which kind of tumors are similar. Okay, and we can use this later on in our analysis if we have to make decisions about treatment, for example, then we, then we can look for a treatments that were successful on patterns that were in the same cluster, then maybe it makes sense to use the same treatment for, uh, well, this type of tumor that we just measured. Okay, uh, then we come to performance measures. So, of course, we have a task, uh, we have experience to improve this task, but we have, we need a way of measuring if my, if we are actually improving on performing this, uh, this test, that's, that's done via performance measures. For classification, uh, a relatively straightforward thing that you could think of is simply count the amount of times that you were actually correct in um, making your prediction. Um, yeah, so let's write it down. Uh, we can write it down mathematically as follows. So uh, we just take the average over this indicator function, which looks at in which cases my uh, label, or actually my prediction, which is this why I had coincides with my label. And this indicator function, we will encounter it more often in the course. It's defined, so let's write it down. This is called an indicator function. And it's defined as being one if yi is yi hat, and it's zero, ah, sorry. Basically, it is zero otherwise. Okay, so you can directly see that if all my predictions are correct, then this sum or this average averages to one. If everything is wrong, then the, the accuracy is zero. And if I'm right 50% of the time, the accuracy value is 0.5. Okay, so we have a way of quantifying how well I'm doing my job at classification. Also for regression, we can think of uh, ways of measuring its performance. 
what is typically used is the mean squared error. Uh, error. You may have encountered that in your studies already. So mean squared error. So again, let's write this down. Uh, we have labeled data. So for every x i, I have a target y i. And I have a prediction that I made. I made this prediction y i hat. I look at the difference, I square it, and I take the, the average over all my uh, samples. So that's the mean squared error. And again, this, this yi, it's sort of this function that we are fitting, which was parameterized by, parameterized by a set of weights w takes as input this xi. So we had labeled uh, data, right? For X, every xi, we had a yi. Okay, so of course, this is what we want to optimize. And this is what we were doing actually in this example before when I was doing this manually. So if we look at the differences of uh, the red line, which is our fit, and the data points, or the blue points, you will see a lot of differences. So we would say this has a large mean squared error. Um, let's go to the third example. These differences are actually not too, too bad. So I would say uh, this is a small mean squared error. And in this particular case, uh, really the, the curve or fit goes straight through these data points. So we would say that this, this right model is actually doing a perfect job because it has a mean squared error of, of zero. Now also when we talk about clustering, we have to come up with a performance measure, a way of saying how, how well we are doing our job. And so we have to think about what our objective is. And with this clustering, really what we're looking for is to find clusters of points that are very similar to each other. And we can quantify this similarity within a cluster by looking at uh, uh, the distance of each point to a cluster center, right? So each cluster had uh, some, some average uh, value and we want to minimize the distance within each other, uh, within the cluster to each of these, these centers. So that's to have a sort of compact group of points. So we can quantify that by looking indeed at the distance of each cluster center towards each point in its cluster. And basically this min operator here is sort of selecting uh, the appropriate cluster, right? So if we take a point of this point, look at the distance to each center, then the blue center is the closest one. And that's the distance what I, that I want to consider. Right, so in the example before, we were actually sort of optimizing this performance measure. Now, a main thing is, is so a main thing in this whole machine learning process is reporting these performance measures. Uh, but the tricky part is um, it could give you a biased view of how well the algorithm is doing. Uh, so if you look at the performance measures on these four models that, that I went through, like a, the first one did a very bad job. The third one was actually doing a great job. And the fourth one, yeah, I mean, given this performance measure, uh, measure, it was doing an excellent job. But if I look at it, I would say it's actually not so good. Uh, so let's see what's happening here. So if we take a look at the best performance on the training set. So the training sets were these blue dots then it's for sure this, this rightmost model it was doing a perfect job on the training set. But if we look at it like, okay, which model is performing best on new data, then it's probably this one, right? So if I take some new point, uh, some X value, and it's probably mapped close to this green, the, the true data with some noise. So let's, so maybe it's somewhere over here, then yeah, I. I have this small distance, so it's actually quite okay. But if I look at the same point in, in this, this right model, then yeah, the, the corresponding point on my model is maybe somewhere over here, so it's, a, it's doing a terrible job and I make a large error. So if I would um, report a performance measure on this new set of points, which I haven't seen before, then the rightmost model does a very poor job, whereas the, the third model actually does a good job. So that brings us to the question on, on which data points should performance be measured? Um, well, it should always be done on a test set, at least if you want to have an impression of how, how well it is at generalizing to new data points, you should always test it on an independent test set. So let me write it down.
performance should be measured on new data so which we typically call test data right so really really uh, remember that whenever you report numbers um, you should do this on a test set which you haven't seen before otherwise you will get a biased impression and you would have the impression that you're doing actually a great job but then when you really move your uh, machine learning algorithm to the field to, to some application it turns out uh, you're actually doing a very terrible job because you uh, actually overfit it to the data. That's what this phenomenon uh, on the right is called. It's called overfitting. All right. So what we did in this, uh, this short lecture is we went through a definition of machine learning. We broke it down into three components. So the main component is a task. So this is really what we designed the algorithm to do. And then based on experience, e, we were improving uh, well, the performance of, of doing this, this task and how well it was performing that was quantified by some performance measure, p. Okay, now that we're all on the same page about uh, what we mean when we talk about machine learning, let's take a closer look at several subtypes of machine learning. So that's provided in this overview figure over here. So roughly speaking, we make a breakdown of machine learning methods into uh, supervised learning methods, of which we already saw examples in the form of regression and classification. We have unsupervised learning methods. We already saw an example in the form of clustering. And then we have reinforcement learning methods, of which I will later on show an example. Now at this point, I want to, on a high level, make clear the distinction between these three classes of machine learning methods. All methods are based, uh, well, they, they adhere to this definition of machine learning in the sense that they have some tasks to perform and they can improve doing this task based on experience. And in a supervised, supervised learning setting, my experience or my data always comes in the form of input, a set of inputs and corresponding targets. So in supervised learning methods, I always have input output pairs, input target pairs. Now, what's characteristic of unsupervised learning methods is that actually I only have these inputs. I have a lot of data and I have an algorithm that does something with the data and becomes better at it, but it isn't focusing on predicting or classifying uh, some corresponding labels that come with the data. So in this case, we only have the data, but not necessarily corresponding labels. Uh, we saw an example of that uh, based on clustering. Reinforcement learning methods is a kind of unique class of machine learning uh, methods in the sense that if you look at supervised and unsupervised learning methods, the, the data is provided upfront, like, um, hello algorithm, here is a lot of experience that I've gathered for you, now do your job and improve yourself. So that's sort of uh, the, the, the supervised and unsupervised learning approach. And reinforcement learning methods, experience is, is gained along the way. So uh, let's write it down. Experience or uh, data is gathered along the way. So it's a sort of loose definition, but later on I'll show an example uh, of, of what I actually mean with this. Okay, so uh, we, make, we made a breakdown into three categories. Now, Let's have a closer look into these three different types, starting off with supervised learning. Again, supervised learning methods always come, uh, the data always comes in pairs of input and a corresponding target. In the case of the MNIST uh, digit classification case, we have an input image and a corresponding digit. So in this case, this represents a two, so the target is this uh, digit class two. In a regression case, we also have input target pairs. So we have an input a value on the x-axis and we want to predict a corresponding value on this t, this target axis, whatever this signal represents. So we have an input and a corresponding output and we have a set of points, these blue points over here that represent the data. Now, what distinguishes uh, these two methods from one another is the way they deal with targets and the way uh, the kind of problems that they solve. In classification problems, uh, 
um, we always are interested in turning an input into a corresponding label. And this target, so this target can only take on values in, uh, can only take on values of this predefined subset of classes. In the digit classification case, it could only be a zero, a one, and so forth, up to a nine. So we could only choose out of 10 classes. So that's characteristic of a classification that the output target is a discrete label. What's character characteristic of regression is that these targets can basically take on any value, any numerical value uh, within some interval. In uh, the regression case, we were interested in predicting some real number which represents this vertical axis. So that's characteristic of regression methods that we're predicting continuous outputs. Right, so in the regression case, I could predict for, for this point, well, uh, some, something over here like a 1.1 1 .1, um, and anything close to it. But in uh, the classification data set, it doesn't make sense to make a prediction of the digit, like saying, okay, this is the digit 2.5 because it isn't a digit. So it isn't in the class of uh, labels that I consider. Okay, so now what's common in these supervised learning methods is that the objective is always to find some function that maps the input to the corresponding target as close as possible. And we want to, this function to do that for all known data sets, so for our, our, our all known data, for our training data, but also for unknown data. And this, I would like to stress this, this reference to unknown data, being able to perform well on unknown data, refers to generalization. And this is important because, uh, of course, we want our, our algorithm to do well on the training data, but also when we deploy it, we, we will encounter data which we haven't seen before and we want it to perform also well on this data. And the example that I gave before with, which related to overfitting was that, okay, I could fit a function that does very well on my training data, on my known data, but whenever I encounter a new point, for example, over here, um, which is probably then lying somewhere over there, there's a huge difference between what I predict and what is actually there. So we want to avoid these mistakes. We want to avoid overfitting. In other words, we want to generalize to unknown situations. Okay, now let's move on to unsupervised learning methods. All right, so in the unsupervised learning methods, I have a, a data, but I do not have corresponding labels. Uh, still, we can devise algorithms that uh, that that solve useful tasks, and one of such tasks is compression. All right. So in this example, I'm going to consider compression. Now, why do I want to do this? Uh, imagine you're, you're running a, a website with thousands of user users, and each user has a, a thumbnail image, an avatar image, and you have to save this on your server. But you're cheap. You want to spend little money on this. Um, you're Dutch, in other words. <laughs> uh, so you only afford a server that uh, that can save up a couple of megabytes of, of disk space. So and so you cannot afford to save all all of these images, which in this example will be of size 100 by 100. And so you want to reduce the amount of data you, you're going to store. So that's the, that's the goal. So uh, to save on disk space, for example. Now. Now there are uh, several ways of doing compression. In this example, I'll take a closer look at a uh, principal component analysis. Um, I won't go into too much specific details, but just want to stick to a high level and the idea of compression in itself. PCA will be covered in chapter 12 and in one of the, the later uh, videos uh, of this course. Now what PCA roughly speaking does, it looks at all the data available and first of all, it looks for a common structure in the data, right? So we have all these images, each has a pair of eyes, a nose and a mouth. And uh, well, we can visualize this commonality by just taking the average of all these images. We average, average these image, images and we get this mean image over here. Okay, so this is a, a sort of generic face, very smooth, smooth uh, skin. Um, it's a face but it's, it's also generic. So I cannot assign this face to each of my users in the database. Um, 
So what principal component analysis also does, it looks for differences between these images. It looks for uh, components, principal components, uh, the, which are visualized over here. So it's sort of, which are also called eigenphases in the computer vision uh, community, which explain the differences between these images. For example, some look a bit more grumpy, uh, not really smiling a lot. Some are smiling a lot. And um, so these are variations in the data. And these principal components capture these variations in the data. And let me explain that with an example below. Um, suppose I want to represent this image now in terms of these principal components. I can do that. So I consider this, these principal components as a basis for representing images. So my starting point would, would be to take the average image value, like this mean image, and then I add an amount of the first principal component, that's MS1. So I find a coefficient alpha i, which I assign to this thing, and so I add this component to my mean. And this is the best I can do that comes close to the original image. So I change the skin color a bit, but still it doesn't look so much like me. Um, but if I then add more details, so apparently my face is different enough from this uh, generic uh, average face, so I need to add more variations to it. Um, so I take more and more of these components. Let's say I take 10 of these components, and I see that I can already recover my face more accurately by uh, adding a bit more of, of different components. All right, so I start recognizing my eyes. Uh, there's a bit, little bit of beard added, so maybe there's a principal component that accounts for variations in beard or, or fair skin. Um, okay, and then we continue. So let's just pick 50 of these uh, principal components because if I look at the second, the MS10 case, uh, there's no smile, there, there needs to be a smile. So uh, I'm looking for my principal components. For example, this one has very dominant teeth in it. So probably in order to achieve an image like this, I need to be add more of this principal component to it. So the, the coefficient that corresponds to the principal component should be high. Well, and then you see if I consider 50 of these principal components, I'm actually starting to do a pretty accurate job in representing the original image. Still, it's a bit noisy. So just to be sure, I go up to 150 of these components. And what I managed to do is recover the image quite well with only 150 of these, um, of these alpha values. Okay, so what does this tell us? Instead of saving 100 by 100 uh, pixels, so 10,000 of these, these values, I can also just save, um, so I can only just save MS150 alpha coefficients. And this saves me a lot of memory. Now, a separate class of, uh, of unsupervised learning methods uh, is clustering. So we already encountered that uh, in the context of tumor analysis, where the goal was, okay, we want to identify clusters of, of tumor samples that are similar. Uh, we could use this information, for example, to, to adjust our treatment plan, because maybe we know that for some tumors, a particular treatment work well. So we want to use the same treatment for, well, uh, a, a tumor which is uh, similar. Now, such clustering methods, they're mostly based around the ID that points in my data are similar, and we want to cluster them into these classes. Now, I already went over an example in the, the previous uh, video, so I won't go into too much detail here. But the point is, with clustering, you can recover structure in the data. Now, there's other types of learning methods, uh, something in between supervised and unsupervised learning method, and this is called well, semi-supervised learning. And the idea here is that again, I have data. So I have data samples x1 up to xn, but now I do not have available the full set of targets. I only have targets available for t1 up to tk, for example, where k is smaller than n. So what this means is I have data, some of it is labeled and some of, some of it, it isn't. Uh, so and and then the goal is to really exploit all available data. Now now let's consider for example let's consider the example of a classification algorithm that looks for images and in, in images it looks for cats and dogs. And so I have a lot of examples. This is an image of a cat and this is an image of a dog. Uh, 
I also have a lot of images for which I don't have this information. But the idea of unsupervised learning method is to recover the structure of data and recover um, well similarities in data. So if I now have a, an image which is very similar to an image of a cat, so it has all the same colors, all the same texture in the image, then I can use this information to assign also the proper label to this image, which probably is, is a, an image of a cat. Okay, so that's the idea of, of super, semi-supervised learning method is try to use all uh, available data that you have. Finally, there's this unique class of machine learning methods uh, called reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, um, what I mentioned before, experience is, is gained along the way. So it's still a learning method. It does some task and it becomes better with more and more experience. But instead of providing all the experience or all the data upfront, gaining experience is part of the algorithm. And this is, for example, also how this famous AlphaGo system was trained. Uh, so it was a computer that learned to play the game of Go and it did a pretty good job at it. And basically it was trained in a simulated environment. Uh, the idea is if I want to learn this game, uh, I could read the rule book, but it doesn't make a good play, you need experience. So in such reinforcement learning systems, we always have to deal with the state of the game, of the, 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 well, the state of the environment. So I have all these, these uh, white and black uh, marbles on the board. Uh, so that's the current state. And now you or the computer as an agent is able to take actions. It can put another piece on the board. And so it, it changes its environment. And this induces a change in the state, but it also leads to a reward or a penalty, right? Because by making this action, I, I either gain some ground on the board or I lose some. I gain some points or I lose some points. And this is then experience, which I can use later on. If it was a good move, then I should remember it maybe I should try this again uh, next time. If it was a bad mood, uh, move, then you remember not to do it uh, again. So such learning methods are typically uh, based on the concept of, of trial and error. Now, applications are mainly in, in the context of, of games. Uh, this, this ranges from, from chess to, to Starcraft or other strategic uh, uh, games. And the reason for this is that they uh, operate in a virtual environment. And this is really convenient for reinforcement learning methods because if you make mistakes in a virtual environment, well, first of all, you can simulate what this uh, action leads to, uh, but also you're not harming your environment. You're only harming a virtual environment in case you make a mistake. Whereas in the practical world, you cannot always afford to make mistakes uh, or not too often or not too severe mistakes. So it's quite a challenge to move this to the practical world, but uh, there are some examples of reinforcement learning uh, being used, for example, uh, in the context of uh, robotics. Okay, that, that's all I have to say for the moment about machine learning. Just want to mention that we have a second year's master course on this topic. So if you're interested, uh, take a look at that. All right, so let me conclude with this, again with this definition of machine learning. Uh, recall that a machine learning algorithm is designed to perform some task and it becomes better uh, with more and more experience. And uh, we just went over three of these examples or three classes, supervised learning methods, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. Um, well, if you take a closer look at it, uh, maybe you paid attention to it throughout the talk, all of these classes are indeed types of machine learning. In this video, I will go over some of the basics of probability theory. Um, I'll approach probability from both a, a frequentist as well as a Bayesian point of view. Uh, most, of, most importantly, I will end this, this uh, video with the statement of Bayes' theorem. And this particular theorem plays an important role all throughout this course. Now, there's many things to be said about probability theory, and I think this is one of the most important statements to be made. Uh, it's taken from the book of Bishop, where he says basically probability theory provides a consistent framework for the quantification and manipulation of uncertainty. So this uncertainty aspect plays a central role all throughout this course and plays a central role in machine learning in general. And so in this machine learning context, we have to deal with uncertainties, uncertainty in, in various ways. First of all, we have to deal with 
uncertainty on my measurements because there's noise on measurements. I have to make observations. We always in, are interested in some real world phenomenon and we want to recover it, we want to model it. Uh, but we'll never, we almost never have exact or direct observations. There's always some measurement noise associated with it. And sometimes we know what this noise is, uh, sometimes we don't know, but we have to take into account there's some noise on the measurements. Now there's also this notion of uncertainty related with the finite size of data sets. You can imagine that, um, that if you have a smaller data set, well, then you know less about the underlying structure or the underlying distribution of the data set. And really only when you may have seen everything in the world, everything in the universe, then maybe with some uh, certainty you can make very strong statements about what this data represents. But in, in reality, you always have to deal with a finite data set. The example that we saw before, for example, uh, related to overfitting, this is, this is really exposing this notion of uncertainty related to the finite size of my data set, which basically sort of tells us that close to my data points, I'm actually doing a good job with, with fitting or describing this, this real world uh, phenomenon. But outside of this, when I encounter new data points, which I haven't seen before, I'm going to make a lot of errors uh, typically. So um, yeah, so that's it about uh, finite size data sets. Now, uh, when we talk about probability theory, we can take on uh, a frequentist interpretation, in which case probability is defined as the fraction of times an event occurs in an experiment. So in this setting, uh, we're going to observe random variables uh, and we just count how many times a particular event happens. And then this defines a probability, which we use to make predictions for the future. In a Bayesian approach, the viewpoint is, is fundamentally different. In this case, probability takes on the meaning as a quantification of plausibility or the strength of a belief. And in a way, this is a more modeling based approach. It's a bit more generic. And let's, let's just go through an example. Uh, suppose I flip a coin and it lands heads or tails and I observe. So now I take on the frequentist interpretation. I observe that it lands five out of five times it lands on heads. So that tells me, well, the probability of this coin landing on head is one, always. It will never land on, on zero. Now, in a Bayesian approach, you are actually able to assign also probabilities to events that never happened before. Uh, for example, uh, so this is a bit more modeling approach. So you start off with the prior belief that my coin is fair and it lands equally often on heads uh, and tails. So my prior belief is that the probability of landing on heads is 50%. But then I start making these observations and I see it lands more often on heads, then, then I can adjust my model. But still I do not fully discard the idea that my uh, coin cannot uh, fall on tail. Um, so I will go over some examples later on, uh, but this especially this Bayesian approach plays a very central role in this course. And if you go to the book of Bishop, you will notice that um, well, it takes a very heavy, um, well, Bayesian viewpoint on machine learning. And well, this is nice because it provides a way of dealing with uncertainty also relating to event that you have never encountered before. Okay. So then let's, let's actually start about pro talking about probabilities. When we talk about probabilities, we're dealing with random variables. These are stochastic variables sampled from a set of possible outcomes, which means that every time I make an observation of such an X, it takes on one of the values in this uh, set of possible values X. So all possible values are indicated with capital X. This indicates the random variable and uh, one particular observation we denote it typically with a small X. Now this variable can be discrete. It can be continuous. And it always comes with a probability distribution, which assigns probabilities to um, a particular event X happening. And this probability is always equal or larger than zero for all X in my possible set of, of outcomes. Um, again here, so we have P of capital X that denotes the entire distribution on the random variable and P of small X denotes the probability of one particular event happening. 
Let's go over some examples. Uh, when we talk about throwing a dice, uh, it can take on six values. So one, two, up to six. So that's my capital X. And the probability of one of these uh, values happening, um, well, considering it's a fair coin, this probability of for each X is actually one over six. For each X, so for each x in this uh, set of x values um, well the same for flipping a coin now the coin can take on two, two values heads or tails and the probability for x landing on head is a half and the probability of x landing on tail is also a half Right, so, okay, so we have a possible a set of possible outcomes, which indicates my random variable x, and then I have probabilities assigned to each particular event uh, happening. Okay, now let's go back to this uh, frequentist interpretation of probability, and consider the case of two random variables. We have a variable x, which in this case can take on the values x1 up to x5, and a random variable y, which can take on the values y1, y2, y3. And now we're going to define the probabilities of these events happening by making observations. So uh, we have this random variable and we make n trials, n observations in which we sample the values for this x. And we start counting how often uh, I encounter a particular combination and we call this NYJ. So NYJ is the number of times that I observe XY together with YJ. And this then defines my probability uh, for, for future observations um, of this event X taking on the value XY and Y taking on the value YJ is given by NYJ divided by the total N, right? Because it's a fraction of time times that I observe something. Similarly, um, if I'm only interested in the xi variable, uh, then I take a look, uh, sorry. Uh, so if I'm only interested in observing the xy variable, then I take a look at all possible outcomes, all possible observation in which I see xy happening with a particular yj, xy, particular yj. So I sum over all these, I make a count of every time I encounter a particular xy with some other yj and I don't care about the yj. So this count is given by the total sum in this column and it's defined over here, right? So it's, we call it the marginalization. Um, we, we move this, we sum and we move this sum to, to the marginal. Okay, so again, in this frequentist case, I count how, how often did I see x, y? Well, that is given by, so that is given by c, y, divided by the total number of observations that I made. Okay, so now I have a, a probability defined, defined for, well, this joint probability of x and y taking on uh, particular values together, and I have a probability of just x taking on some value. With this, I can actually establish an important identity related to probabilities. So let's just rewrite uh, first this term. So I mark it with a star and write NYJ in terms of the probability. So NYJ is the probability of X taking on the value XY, Y taking on the value YJ times N, uh, right? Because N yeah, okay, so this gives us the number of times I, I made this observation and I made n observations in total. Then what I'm going to do, I'm going to use this uh, marginal equation over here. And I'm going to insert this expression for nyj in here. And we have this equation, this identity, and I put it in on the left-hand side. So here I'm going to plug in this probability, probability uh, definition for the single variable x, y. And what we then get is that we have that the probability of x 
taking on the value x, y is given by the sum over these uh, y values of this n, y, j. So let's write it out. x taken on x, y, y taken on y, j. And these n terms, they cancel out in uh, so these cancel out on the left and right hand side. So this, so what we just have derived is called the sum rule of probability. So it says that the probability of, well, x taken on some value is the marginalization of the joint probability over the y uh, variable. So this is called the sum rule of probability. Yes, so what we did here, we made a definition of these probabilities and then we rewrote it uh, based on this counting uh, intuition and we came up with an identity that is always satisfied. Okay, now what we're going to do next is derive a second identity, uh, but first we're going to define a so-called conditional probability of y occurring given the fact that we already observed a particular value of x. So again, we have two random variables x and y and now suppose I already have observed uh, my x uh, value then I'm only considering the options falling in this particular column and again in this frequentist interpretation I will look at a fraction of times that this uh, particular event occurs relative to, to my total number of observations that, that fall in this category so the conditional probability of y taken on some value yj given that I already had made an observation xy is then given by nyj divided by cy. Right? I make an observation of y taken on some particular value given the fact that I already have observed some xy. So I'm only considering these cases, the sum, the total observations where x, y took on some value was given by c, y, right? So this is a definition of the conditional probability, uh, probability of y given x, uh, specifically in this um, frequentist interpretation. Okay, so now we're going to do something similar that we just did before, and we're going to rewrite n, y, j in terms of this probability. Uh, so n, y, j, uh, the number of times this particular event happened is given by the probability of y j given that I observed x y times c y right because this comes from this uh, identity divided by n so I'm, I'm rewriting I'm rewriting this term over here and then we also know uh, that the probability of just making the observation x, y is given by c, i over n. So let's insert this also in the equation. So that gives me, that uh, that tells us that the joint distribution of x and y is given by the product of this conditional distribution of y given x times the probability of x taken on this value x y and this is called the product rule okay so we have derived another important identity so in addition to a sum rule which talks about marginalization we also have a product rule which basically says that I can always recover my joint probability distribution from the conditional distribution multiplied with what we call a prior distribution, which is only dependent on one of these uh, variables. Now let's take a look at some examples uh, visually. So again, we have uh, two random variables, X and Y, and we're going to make observations. And this defines then a data set of observations, where every time I observe a particular X and a particular Y, and I have uh, 60 of these uh, observations. So this is an example from the book of Bishop. And now I'm going to count how often this, uh, each observation falls in, in a particular bin. So that's what we see. Well, and that's what we saw in the previous example. So 
with all these observations, we're going to build, or we are able to build a joint dis distribution. If we're only interested in, uh, let's say the X variable, we can marginalize. So we can uh, marginalize in, in this direction and observe this marginal distribution x and the marginalization is taken over y so you could say we marginalize over y to obtain the marginal distribution p of x and we did this via the, the sum rule of probabilities similarly we can uh, marginalize over over x so we, we're no longer interested in x we only want to know how often did we see uh, y happening or what is the probability of y so this gives us the marginal P of Y. And again, we use uh, the sum rule. So we marginalized out all these X values of this joint distribution. Um, yeah, I'm going to write it like this. Okay, so that gives me the marginal P Y. And finally, we can take a look at um, conditional distributions. So given we have already observed uh, y is 1, what is then the probability of an event x happening? So in that case, we're only looking in this particular block. And this gives us the conditional the conditional probability, probability distribution of p y given x. Now for each of these dis distributions, we have that um, they, we have this normalization uh, property, meaning that if we take the sum over the particular random variable, um, let's look at the conditional probability distribution, the sum of y taken on the value yj given xy equals one, right? The, the total, suppose I consider everything, then this probability is one. And in the case of the conditional probability distribution, this actually directly follows from, from its definition where we, uh, where we thought of counting, well, a particular combination uh, relative. So we take the fraction relative to the total number of times uh, an event happens in this, this column. Okay, so now we talked about discrete random variables. Now let's take a closer look at continuous random variables. Um, the definitions are very similar. And now we think of the probability of X, which can take on any value uh, following in some small interval um, of size DX is given by the probability of X times DX. And we call P of X, we call it a probability density. And Whenever you deal with densities, um, you typically measure things happening on those densities via integration. Uh, for example, the probability of x taking a value in some interval is given by the integral from a to b of this probability of x uh, times dx. Okay, um, maybe that, that's, that's visualized better in, in this figure. So red in this case is a probability density function and uh, we want to know what is the probability of an X taken on a value in this infinitesimal volume element, then we just integrate and we sum over, well, over this, this green area that you see over here. And this gives me the probability of an event happening in that uh, small range or small uh, interval. And if we want to consider larger intervals, um, yeah, then we have to integrate this area and that gives us the total probability of an event ha happening in that particular interval. So from A to B, for example. Okay, uh, so also for probability density, uh, densities, we have this property that's, that the, each probability should be larger or equal to zero. We have the, this normalization property. So um, the probability integrates from zero, uh, from minus infinity to infinity it should take on the value one. And this makes sense, right? Because um, in, in this particular case, from minus infinity to infinity, I consider the possibility of X 
falling into this this uh, this interval from minus infinity to infinity, and that of course always happens. So the probability should be one. Okay, so finally something has to be said about uh, a change of variables. So when we're dealing here with continuous variables and we can apply a transformation to these variables to obtain a new uh, description of this variable, which may be more convenient to work with. Um, consider, for example, the case that maybe your measurements are done in, in meters. Let's say meters, we're talking about distances, but I want to express this in terms of kilometers. Now, um, so you can apply this transformation, you multiply by a factor 1000 and that, that gives you um, the number of meters in a kilometer. But then also, uh, so when we talk about probabilities in this continuous sense, we talk about intervals and this, uh, these infinitesimal volume elements, dx. So in our original distribution, we have that, uh, well, the probability of x falling into one, let's say square meter or one meter is given by p of x times dx. Now I want to define my new distribution p of y in terms of kilometers, for example, uh, but now my volume element is defined in terms of uh, kilometers. So we have to apply some correction factor here. So this actually tells us that the new probability of y is given in terms of the original probability times some dx dy, where this second term is a correction factor for this the scaling. I mean, we write we write absolute uh, values here because the probabilities needs, need to be positive. And in this, this case, we don't, do not distinguish between reflections or changes of signs that take place in this uh, change of uh, variables. Um, yeah, okay, and if you take a closer look in, in this, uh, if you're familiar with substitution of variables in integration, then uh, you can derive that this factor is actually given by the uh, differential of this uh, mapping to y and the absolute of it. So actually this correction term can be dependent on the parameter y. Uh, in the case of a linear transformation, it isn't, it's just a constant, a correction constant. But in general, um, it doesn't have to be. And then you get very complex, you can get very complex distributions, which no longer look like your original distribution. Okay, so those are some core things to take into account when working with continuous random variables. Um, for continuous random variables, we can also define a thing called a cumulative distribution function. And a cumulative distribution function is uh, defined as, so we write a capital P of X as the probability of X taken on a value smaller than this reference x, right? So now we consider an interval from minus infinity to x. And we know uh, that, well, we can write this as the integral from minus infinity to x of this probability x dx. I write these tildes there because these x tildes are dummy or integration uh, variables. Okay, now these cumulative distribution functions, they can be useful to work with. And they have a, a very useful property, namely that if I again take this, uh, the differential of this uh, p of x dx, I obtain my original probability density. Okay, so that's all there is to say uh, for now. Okay, so now let's summarize uh, what we encountered so far. So in the discrete setting, uh, we have this additivity uh, property, meaning that if you want to know the probability of x taking on any of the values in some subset A, this is given by the sum of the probabilities of each x happening. So we have this additivity property. In a continuous setting, we also have something like that. And when we consider x taking on any value on the interval from A to B, this is given by the integral from A to B of these probabilities. Right, so we sum or we integrate all these uh, probabilities. Um, in both settings, we have this positivity uh, criterion that each probability is zero or larger than zero. Then um, we have this normalization uh, thing. So if you consider the probabilities over all my set, over all my domain, then this entire probability should integrate to one. And we have a similar thing in uh, the discrete setting 
meaning that if I sum over all values x of this probability x, then this should sum to 1. Um, then we have this sum rule, which refers to the marginalization, so sort of getting rid of one of the variables. Uh, so it's dealing with a joint probability distribution. And if I have such a joint probability distribution and I only interested in the x variable, I can sum over all these y components. And a similar rule we have in the continuous setting, where if I want to know the probability distribution p of x, given my uh, joint probability distribution, it is given by the integral over all, sorry, given by my integral over the entire y of this joint distribution x and y dy. And finally, uh, we also derived a product rule from these basic definitions of probabilities, stating that I can always recover my joint probability distribution um, by taking the product of a conditional distribution x given y times a prior a probability of y happening independent of x. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients in place to derive Bayes' theorem, and this is an important identity uh, that is useful for, for manipulating uh, probabilities. So, so let's just first derive it, and then I'll give a bit more interpretation to it. First of all, um, we start off with the product rule. So we derived it, uh, and so now we're going to use it. Uh, then uh, we take a look at the symmetry property, which basically says that, that the probability of an event x and y happening at the same time is the same as the probability of y and x. So we change the order here, happening at the same time. So of, of course this, we have the symmetry here. Now if we apply the product rule to this thing, then p of y and x is given by the probability of y given x times the probability of x. Now what we can do, we can equate the both right hand sides and this gives me the so-called Bayes rule. So now I'm going to take a look what is the probability, the conditional of y given x, it is given by the conditional of probability the conditional probability of x given y times py divided by p of x. Okay, so it's, well, now, now, now that we know the product rule and the symmetry property, it's, it's pretty straightforward to actually derive Bayes' theorem, but it has some very important implications. It, it provides a way of changing viewpoints on probabilities. So, right, so on the le left-hand side, we're considering a probability of y given x, on the right-hand side, a core component is this probability of x given y. And this Bayes rule provides a way to, to sort of change your viewpoint on, on, on whatever uh, problem you're, you're dealing with. Finally, there's something to be said about this uh, denominator, p of x. Um, so I'm, again, I'm going to make a derivation and then we'll, we'll give some interpretation on what we're looking at here. So first of all, um, we are dealing with a probability, a conditional probability here on the left hand side with respect to the random variable y. And this means it's a probability, so it means that we have this normalization um, property, meaning that if I sum over all my probabilities y given x, then this sum uh, reduces uh, to 1. Let me just move it over there. Okay. Uh, the same holds for the right hand side then, right? Because we have this equation over here. So also if I take the sum over y in the right hand side and then uh, 1 over px, x, this p of x doesn't depend on y, so I can move it up front. This sum x conditional on y times the prior of y equals to 1. And okay, and from this we can directly derive that of x can also be written in terms of the sum okay so what we did here is we rewrote this denominator term so this p of x entirely in in terms of the items that we see in the numerator and we sum here over y, uh, 
which is sort of, uh, so we can think of this as a normalization constant that makes sure that this conditional probability indeed satisfies this property. Well, it's a given in most cases, but sometimes you do not have this P of X given and you want to derive it uh, yourself. And then this identity uh, plays an important role. Okay, so that's Bayes' theorem. Now, when we work with Bayes' theorem, we often give names to each of these individual terms. And uh, what we're working towards through is finding a probability distribution of a conditional of Y given some observation X. So we're talking about observations and then assigning probabilities to, well, to my other remaining random variable Y. And in this context, we are dealing with a prior probability of y. So I was already calling it a prior and we call it a prior probability because before I observe it, because before I know anything, I have some prior assumption of y taking on some value. So prior says before observing x, I already have some probability of y taking on some value. And then uh, I have a so-called posterior probability. So this is actually what we're after. So once we have observed an X value, we, we then take a look at what is the probability of uh, Y taking place. So this is, sorry. So this is uh, after observing X. Then we have the, this other term, which also has a unique name, and it, this is called the likelihood, the likelihood of X given a particular Y. And often this thing is, recall, is referred to as likelihood function rather than a likelihood probability distribution. And it has to do with the fact that we're dealing here with a conditional probability distribution, but it's a, a probability with respect to the random variable X, so it's a conditional probability with respect to X. But in this particular case, most often we're interested in this Y uh, variable. And in this formula, uh, in this conditional probability, Y acts as a condition. It's, 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 let's say, a parameter that parameterizes this distribution of X. Um, so if we look at the likelihood, it is a function with respect to y. And this become clearer later on, but it's important to realize this because sometimes you think, okay, why, why is this called a, a likelihood function and not a probability? And uh, when we talk about the likelihood function, we, we are probably <laughs> interpreting this thing with respect to its uh, conditional argument. And uh, so, and this doesn't mean that if I look at all values over y, that this particular thing integrates to one. Um, okay, so that's what we call the likelihood of x given y. And then finally here, um, let's use this color. We have uh, the probability of x, and this is called the evidence uh, for x. Okay, so that wraps it up for this video. Uh, in the next video, we'll take, uh, take a look at some example and gain some more intuition of what these four individual terms actually mean. Okay, so now that we've covered some core definitions in uh, probability theory, let, let's go over some examples to, to gain some intuition. In this example, we are going to consider the process of picking fruits from boxes and um, well, these boxes have colors. And um, so one time we pick an orange, one time we pick an apple, sometimes it's from the red box, sometimes it's from the blue box. So we're considering two random variables here. So the first random variable is called, uh, it's the fruit, uh, denoted with F. So F is the fruit and it takes on the values apple, or it can be an orange, denoted with an O. Then we have another random variable, and that's the box that we pick from. Uh, we denote it with capital B. So the box can be either red, red, or it can be blue. And before anything, we, we know 
uh, which boxes we pick from. So this is our prior knowledge. Uh, someone told me, okay, we're going to do this experience. You're going to pick from these boxes and 60% of the time, 60% uh, of the time you're going to pick from the, the blue box. So the prior probability of picking from the blue box is six out of 10, 60%. And then the prior probability of picking from the red box is 40%. We also know the amount of fruits in each box. So this gives us conditional probabilities. Uh, so suppose we uh, pick from the blue box, then we know there's only one orange in it. So the probability of picking an orange from the blue box is one out of four. So let's write, write these conditional probabilities out. So first let's consider picking uh, fruit being an orange, given the fact uh, that I'm told that I picked it from the blue box, this probability is one out of four, uh, four. Similarly, the probability of picking the fruit apple from the blue box is three out of four. Uh, the conditional probabilities for the red box are given as follows. So I suppose I want to know what the probability is of picking an orange, given the fact that someone told me that the box is red. This probability um, is six out of eight, which is three fourth. The probability of picking an apple from the red box is then given to be one over four. Okay, so this is everything I know up front. So I have this probability, uh, uh, the, the prior probabilities. So without making any observation, the chance of picking the, the blue box will be 60%. And I know the amount of apples and oranges uh, in inside each of these boxes. Okay, so now we're going to use the rules of probability theory to derive prob uh, probabilities for things that we're interested in. And in this case, we only want to know what is the probability of picking an apple or what is the probability of picking an orange, disregarding the box it came from. And this is a marginalization process. So we marginalize out the, 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 the color variable, so we do not care about which color the box was it came from. Uh, and what remains is the, the marginal fruit distribution. Okay, so let's make use of this uh, marginalization and this sum rule of probability. So the probability of picking an apple equals the sum of the probabilities of picking an apple in either of the two boxes. So I sum over the boxes. Now this is a joint probability, the, the probability of picking an apple from box B. So ha they happen at the same time. And at this point, we do not know this joint probability, but we know the product rule of probability. And the product rule says that this joint probability can be recovered from the product of a conditional probability. So the conditional of the, the chance of picking the apple given uh, the fact that I know which box I, uh, I picked from, times the prior probability of picking this box in the first place. Okay, and now we have something that we actually know, right? We know all the conditionals and we know these prior probabilities. So let's write out what's happening here. I'm going to use a different color. Uh, okay, so what is the probability of picking an apple from the blue box? That's three out of four times the prior probability of picking the blue box. That's um, six out of 10. Okay, then the next box. So what is the conditional probability of picking the apple from the red box? That is one over four times uh, the prior of picking the red box, which is four out of 10. And this gives me a probability of 11 over 20. Yeah. Okay, so now I know the total probability of picking an apple and don't, without caring about which box it came from. I can do it similarly for um, the oranges. So I'm going to write, that, write this out. And this would give us 9 over 20. Okay, uh, so... This is, this can be a somewhat tedious process that we have computers uh, for us to do this, but conceptually it's good to make such computations every now and then to, to really get a feeling of what you're, you're dealing with. 
Uh, but in this particular case, we could have also taken a shortcut knowing that uh, these probabilities all need to add up to one. Um, so that's a normalization property of these probabilities. So we could also directly, so we know that we only have two options. So we could also derive this from the total probability one minus the probability of picking an apple, which was 11 over 20, which also would give, give us a probability of nine over 20. So this would be a much uh, faster way, of course. Now in, in this next example, we're going to ask ourselves the question, um, if making part of the observation, so having seen that we picked an orange, for example, does this provide us more information on which box it came from? And, and the answer is yes. And uh, we're going to show that via uh, Bayes rule. Now, okay, so Bayes rule said, let's suppose I have this conditional, this posterior, like um, the posterior probability of Let's note it. The posterior probability of observing a red box, given the fact that I observed an orange, is given by the likelihood of the fruit being orange were it to be picked from the red box, times the prior probability of picking the red box, divided by the total probability of, of picking an orange um, at all. Okay, so these are quantities uh, that we know. We know uh, the prior probabilities, we know the conditional probabilities, so uh, how many oranges are there in the red box, and we have these marginal probabilities, so the total, uh, sorry, the, the total chance of, of picking an orange. Okay, so now let's use this, uh, this rule, this formula to fill in these probabilities and see what, what comes out. So, uh, the conditional probability of picking an orange from the red box that was derived here, um, which is three over well six over eight. We have the prior probability of picking from the red box, which is four over ten. Yeah, it's four over ten. And then we have um, the probability of the picking orange is nine over twenty. So I'm going to invert this twenty over nine. Okay, so um, let's do this computation. Uh, 20 divided by 10 is 2, uh, 2 times 4 is 8, 8 divided by 8 is 1. So we have a total probability of 6 over 9, which gives us a probability of 2 over 3. Right? So this is approximately 66%. Uh, so this is really interesting because now uh, our prior uh, probability of picking the red box was only 40%. Uh, but now once we have observed an orange, this changes the probability of uh, picking uh, from the red box. And actually it turns out that this probability is 66%. So this is larger than so the probability of picking the red box, given that I've uh, observed the orange, it's much larger than my prior. Okay, so in terms of this, uh, of these terminologies that, that I re referred to in the previous video, we now have uh, a posterior probability. So after observing an orange, the probability of the box being red is given by 66%. Um, but we also have this, we also had this prior uh, probability. So before observing anything, we had uh, a probability of four over 10. Uh, okay, so we have before observing anything, we have a prior probability. And after we observed part of the, the process, we gain more information and we get uh, a posterior probability of the box taking on some color given the fact that I made a particular observation. Okay, then there's a, another thing to be said about random variables. They can be independent. Uh, so this is really a definition. Uh, of two random variables, X and Y, are said to be independent if and only if measuring X gives no information on Y and vice versa. So. Uh, let's let's formalize this uh, in an equation. So formally, x and y are called independent if the probability, the joint probability of x and y equals the product of each of these individual uh, probabilities. So there's no dependency between the two of them. And we can see that this, this works, that this sort of uh, defines independence in the following way. Suppose there was independence and we want to know what is the probability given my observation y. Then, um, okay, so from the product rule, 
let's write it over here. So from the product rule, we know that this joint probability is given by probability of X given Y times the probability of Y. Okay, so I'm going to plug it in here. So the probability of X given Y equals the joint probability of X and Y divided by the probability of Y. And if these uh, variables are independent, then this probability splits into these two separate probabilities of X and Y respectively. And then we see that this conditional probability only depends on X. So indeed, if my uh, random variables are independent, well, then we can, we can, then we can split this joint probability and we can see that as uh, the conditional probabilities are only dependent on well the, the x parameter and there's no real conditioning taking place. An example again in terms of apples and oranges, uh, we have two random variables, we have the, the box color and we have the fruit that we pick. Suppose now in both boxes we have a ratio of apples to oranges is one. So we have um, apples to oranges is one ratio apples to oranges, in this case it's 2 over 2 is 1, so they're equal. And in that sense they do not provide any information on uh, which box I pick from, right? Because if I consider the conditional probability of the fruit, given the fact that I observe the box, it will also be just the total probability of picking this fruit. The total probability of picking an apple, so there are in total 6 apples, there are in total six oranges, so the probability of picking uh, an apple is 50% is for both uh, of the fruits. And the same also works the other way around. Um, in this case, knowing uh, the fruit does not provide us extra information on the box, and what we're left with is only our prior information. In this video, I will continue going over some of the core definitions in probability theory. Specifically, I will define the expected value, variance and covariance. Then I will go over one of the most widely used probability distributions out there, namely the Gaussian distribution. This is a parametric prob probability distribution, which we will encounter throughout this course. So it will definitely pay off to pay attention now. Um, now, this Gaussian distribution will also serve as an example for explicitly computing the expectation and variance. Okay, so let's start with uh, the expectation. Now, remember, we're talking probability theory here, so uh, we, we're dealing with random variables. Again, this random variable uh, can take on some value, denoted with small x, out of a set of all possible outcomes, denoted with capital X. Now, some outcomes are more prob probable than others. And we denote this by saying that uh, x is a random variable with respect to some probability, probability distribution uh, p of x. Now, expectations are computed uh, from functions, uh, so functions from x to r. Okay, so then the expectation is defined as follows. So we compute the expectation of f of x, uh, where x is a random variable, uh, with respect to this uh, probability distribution. In the discrete case, it is defined simply as the sum over all possible outcomes of this function f of x weighted with the probability of x. In the continuous setting, we have a similar definition. Now the, uh, the sum becomes an integral, so we integrate over the entire domain x this function f of x weighted with the corresponding probability p of x dx. Okay, so these are two definitions. One is for the discrete setting and the other is for the continuous setting. Now we do not always have direct access to this uh, probability distribution, uh, but we could still make an uh, approximation of this expectation. And we do so by again sort of adopting this uh, frequentist uh, viewpoint of things. So we make n uh, observations so let's write this, so one observation x1, x2. So we observe capital N number of these uh, random variables. Then uh, from all these observations, we can make an uh, approximation of the expectation simply by taking the average over all samples 
So from n is 1 to capital N, um, the function values evaluated on these samples. Okay, so this is really just computed the mean, computing the mean. And remember that in this frequentist uh, point of view, the probabilities were really defined as the fraction of times that I observe one of these uh, random variables, one of these values that the random variable uh, takes on. Uh, so the fraction of time. And you can imagine that this sort of, in this frequency setting, indeed, we have that um, maybe some values for x happen more often, so they contribute more to this sum. So we have a sort of weighted sum where um, each value is weighted by the number of times that uh, this value is observed. Now expectations are always computed uh, in the context of random variables uh, with respect to some probability distribution. And this probability distribution can also be conditional. Uh, so we have actually the same definition here in a discrete case. We sum over all possible outcomes x. Uh, so this uh, function values of x weighted by the conditional probability of x given that I already made an observation um, y. In the continuous setting, we have the same definition, but now we integrate f of x and we weight it with the conditional probability. Okay, so these are definitions of the expected value and it can be interpreted as a weighted mean where uh, the weight is uh, according to the probability of particular samples uh, being observed. Okay, now let's define the variance. The variance is defined as the expected quadratic distance between f and its mean, and the mean is denoted with this expected value of f. Okay, so let's write out what the statement says. We're computing the expected value of the distance, the square distance of f of x to its mean and this squared, so the expected value of the square distance. Okay, so really this is the definition. And what I'm going to do next, I'm going to uh, write this out and show that this variance actually splits in two separate terms. And these two separate terms will often be more convenient to work with. Um, okay, so let, let's just do that. So let's write out this expectation of this uh, quadratic term over here. So that gives us the term f of x squared minus 2 f of x times the expectation of f uh, plus the expectation of f of x squared. Now before I continue, I just want to remark that the expected value is a linear operator. So if I take the expected value of two functions, the sum of two functions, then this splits in the expected value of f plus the expected value of g. Okay, so this is relatively straightforward to show. The same uh, for, uh, let's say, if I scale a function f of x, let's write it out. So uh, in the discrete setting, we have, we take the sum of x, c times f of x, weighted with the probability of x. The c can be moved to the front. And then we see that we indeed we have that we can scale the expected value. Uh, finally, um, the expected value of some constant, so it doesn't depend on x, is simply given by uh, this constant, right? Because um, the sum over all probabilities equals one. So the expected value of a constant would give us the constant itself. Okay, so with these properties in place, we can show that this expected value can be split into three terms. So we have the expected value of f of x squared. Then um, this is a constant, this two is a constant, so both can be moved outside and then I compute the expected value of f of x. So this would actually give us an extra expected value f of x. And let's just write that, so the expected value f of x times these two terms, so minus two. Um, yeah, so this becomes a square plus the expected value of f of x squared, right? Because once we compute the expected value, it becomes a constant, it's no longer depending on x. So, uh, and then we take the expected value of this constant, which just 
gives me this thing. So we have these three terms. Uh, we gather uh, terms of the same form. So we actually have the following. Okay, so what we see, um, so what we did, we have this definition. So the variance is defined as the expected value of the quadratic distance between f and its mean. And this variance can be split into the expected value of f squared minus the square of the expected value of f. Okay, so let's go over a quick example to, to get a visual impression of what we're dealing with here. So suppose we have a random variable, x, which is drawn from a uniform distribution on the interval 0, 1. So that means that I'm going to sample points between 0 and 1, and each point is equally likely uh, to occur. Then uh, I have a function of x. So f is a function on this random variable. So let, let's just draw a function. Suppose it, it looks like this. Then of this, we can compute its expected value. So that will be its mean. And each point contributes equally well to this uh, mean. So we really have this particular uh, straight line. So this will be the expected value of f, where this blue line will be f of x. Um, now, when we compute the variance, we take a look at the square distance of each point f of x to its mean. And that would give us uh, this particular variance of f of x. Uh, now suppose I would have a different signal. Uh, let's say it looks like this. It's almost constant. So we call it uh, g of x. Also of this, we can compute its mean. It may look something like this. So that's the expected value of g. We can compute the variance. So the squared distance of each of these fx values to the mean. And in this particular case, I would obtain a low variance g of x, whereas in, compar in comparison, uh, the top one would be a large uh, variance. Right, so the variance really captures the amount of variations in my data relative to the expected value. So that's it for the variance. We can also talk about covariance. Covariance measures the extent to which two random variables, x and y, vary together. So let me just uh, give the definition straight away. So we compute the expected value of these two random variables defined relative to this uh, joint probability distribution. So we compute the ex expected value of x relative to its mean times y relative to its mean. So similar to the, to the variance case, we compute the expected value of some uh, quadratic form. And also this particular quadratic form can be split into uh, these two components. So let's take a look at how this works. So we compute the expected value of x times y minus x expected value of y minus y expected value of x. Uh, let's see, plus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. And also of this thing, of course, we, we can uh, use these linearity properties, which gives us this first term, the expectation of x times y. And we have uh, these three terms, which actually all give the expectation of x times the expectation of y. Well, uh, y so let's, get, let's gather this, and this would give us the following. Okay, so what we did here, we gave a definition of the covariance. The covariance measures uh, the extent to which two random variables x and y vary together, and also this covariance can be split into two separate terms. Now we also want to be able to deal with uh, vectors of random variables x and y, so these x and y are random vectors. And we want to be able to, to measure the covariance uh, between them. And this covariance uh, between these two vectors is defined as follows. So again, let's denote that x and y are defined relative to some probability distribution. Then we take the expected value of x relative to its mean 
times y relative to its mean. But these are vectors and I'm going to put a transpose over here. Now, what does this mean? So uh, we have this over here, this is a vector. It is, so vectors we consider as column vectors. So this will be a vector with d rows and one column. Um, for the y, we applied a transpose. So this will be a row vector of one by d. And that means that this entire um, covariance thing becomes a covariance matrix. So this will be of size r d by d. Now each element uh, in this matrix then encodes for the amount of variation uh, between each of the components of the, the two uh, random vectors. Also this uh, covariance matrix breaks down into two components, namely the expected value of x y transpose minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y and this thing transpose. Okay, so this is the definition of the covariance matrix. And also this covariance breaks down into two separate terms. Now let's uh, think about this for a moment. So the covariance uh, measures the amount of, of covariance between two uh, random variables. Uh, before we encountered so-called independent variables. So independent variables were defined as, uh, in a loose way, they do not influence each other. Uh, so we expect actually that this covariance matrix between two independent random variables will be zero. Okay, so let's write this out uh, and show that this is actually the case. Now, what do we know about independent variables? Let's say X and Y. Uh, we know that uh, their joint probability distribution, X and Y, breaks down or splits into independent distributions. Okay, now let's just compute the covariance. So the covariance is given as the expected value of X times Y minus the expected value of X times the expected value of Y. Now let's have a look at this uh, first term. So we just fill in the definition of the expectation. So we compute the integral over X and Y of this function, x, y, weighted with this joint probability distribution, dx, dy. Okay, now the joint probability splits in, in two terms. So we have the integral over x, we have the integral over y, x, y, px, py, dx, dy. Now we can split this integral into two separate parts, one only depending on x and the other only depending on y. That would give us the integral x, px, dx, and for the other one, the integral over y, py, dy. And this we recognize as two individual expectation. The expectation over x times the expectation over y. Okay, so now we can plug this right back in, back in and we see that indeed the covariance uh, between two independent variables is indeed equal to zero. Okay, this is an important uh, thing to know. The covariance between two independent variables equals to zero. But it's also very important to realize that um, measuring a covariance of zero does not necessarily mean that you're dealing with independent random variables. So we showed it one direction. So if you have independent variables, the covariance is zero. But the other way around, this is not necessarily the case that if we measure covariance zero, that the X and Y are independent. And I'm going to show that with a counter example. Suppose my x is drawn from a uniform distribution on the interval minus 1 to 1. So that really means that the probability for each of these x values, which can take on the values between minus 1 and 1, is given by a constant. Uh, specifically, it's given by a half. Okay, so this is my first random variable. And then I define a second one. y is x squared. So this y clearly depends on x squared. It's there in the definition y is x squared. Now if we compute the covariance between them, so let's do that. So the covariance between x and y is given by the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x, expected value of y. We will see that this equals to zero. And why is this the case? So this first term involves an integral from minus one to one of x to the power three, right? Because we multiply x with x squared, and this is weighted 
with a constant probability of a half. Now this integral equals uh, integrates to zero because we have an odd function which is integrated over an, over an even domain. Okay, so we can get rid of this term, this term becomes zero. Similarly, the expectation of x, x is also a, an odd function, uh, becomes zero. So both become zero because they are odd functions. Okay, so this is also important to remember that if you measure covariance zero, this does not necessarily imply that x and y are independent. Uh, finally, you may encounter uh, a notation like this, the covariance of x, that is then implicitly understood to be the covariance between x and itself, because the covariance is always a measure between two random variables. Now let's talk about the Gaussian distribution. Throughout this course, we have encountered distributions in all these definitions, but never really took a, took a closer look at what these look like. We did, however, take a frequentist approach to these distributions and gave an example of apples and oranges, but now we move to a more Bayesian point of view, and this allows us to deal with continuous random variables. In this Bayesian approach, we will model probabilities using parametric distributions. These are distributions with an analytic description that allows us to control what the distribution looks like. Now, the Gaussian distribution is one of the most widely used parametric distributions and we will use it throughout this course. This is what it's going to look like. So we have that uh, the Gaussian distribution, also called, often called the normal distribution, hence this n, it's a distribution with respect to a random variable x. And it is parameterized by this mu parameter, which we, which we will refer to as the mean. And we have the sigma squared, which we will refer to as the variance. Uh, now this is what it looks like. It has this front factor, square root of two pi sigma squared, and this exponential one over two sigma squared times x minus mu squared. Okay, so what are we looking at? So we have this mu parameter over here. This mu parameter really determines the location of the maximum of this distribution. Uh, because what we're looking at here is the square distance of our variable x to this mu. And if x is close to mu, then uh, the square distance is close to zero, and then e to the power of zero, um, well, it will be close to one. So if we move further away from mu, this distance will increase, and then we have e to the power minus something very large, so the probabilities will decay to zero if we move away from mu. Now, a sigma squared or sigma determines the width of this distribution. If sigma is very small, then uh, we actually really only consider assigning high probabilities to points that are close to mu. And as soon as we leave the vicinity of mu, this thing will decay to zero because this thing quite rapidly becomes very large. Um, yeah, and if sigma becomes very large, then we get a very wide distribution and then we start um, more equally assign probabilities to all of these values on, on the x-axis. Still, they decay to zero if we move away from mu. Then we're looking at a distribution, and distributions are normalized to integrate to one. So if we integrate this distribution with respect to its random variable x, this entire thing should evaluate to one, and that's why we have this correction term up front. So we have a mean parameter, this determines the location of the maximum of this distribution, and we have a variance parameter, which determines the width of this distribution. Now I've been calling this parameter mu the mean of the distribution. And I do this for a reason, because if we actually compute the mean, if we compute the expected value of x, which is random relative to this normal distribution, we can show that this mean becomes mu. So now we have an analytic form of the distribution. Let's actually do this computation. Let's actually compute the expected value. Okay, so this is what we do. We compute the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x weighted by its probability. So multiplied this Gaussian distribution. Now this uh, integral looks quite complicated. It's hard to compute. So we're going to simplify it and we do this via a change of variables. So I'm going to make a clever choice here that significantly reduces uh, this integral. So I choose y is 1 over 
the square root of 2 sigma uh, squared times x minus mu. And I do this because if I insert this in, in the equation, then actually this exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. Of course, we also need to substitute for the other instances of x. So let's see what x should be. This basically defines x to be um, the square root of 2 sigma squared times y plus mu. Okay, so let's plug it in into the equation. Okay, and now also we have to take a look at this integration measure. So let's see, dy dx is given by 1 over 2 sigma squared, uh, the square root of it. So dx has to be square root of 2 sigma squared dy. So we plug it in. Now this already looks a bit more friendly. Uh, we can clean it up. We can get rid of these terms, these factor out. And what we get is, and what we get is the integral of two components really. So we're computing now the integral of uh, two functions. One is an odd function. So this is y times the exponential of uh, minus y squared. So this is an even function. This is an odd function. So this becomes an uneven or an odd function. And we know that if we integrate odd functions from minus infinity to infinity, the left part of the domain cancels out the positive part. So we actually know that this thing, this part of the integral will evaluate to zero. Now that greatly simplifies our uh, integral. Now we only have to look at the integral of e to the power minus uh, y squared. And for this, we're going to make use of this property that this integral evaluates to the square root of pi. So that gives us mu divided by the square root of pi times the square root of pi is mu. Okay, so what I showed is if we actually compute the expected value of x, where x is a random variable relative to, to this Gaussian distribution, which is parameterized by a mu and a sigma squared, we actually obtain that this expected value becomes mu. Now this is quite an exercise, but the main point is that I wanted to show you an example of how to explicitly compute the expected value and show you that given an, an analytic or parametric form of a distribution, we can indeed analytically derive solutions. There's no magic to it, but it does require some mathematical practice. And I showed this example because throughout this course, uh, we will work with Gaussian distributions a lot. We will make use of formulas that are based on derivations like these. And the least I hope for is that when the book or me in one of the talks explains that some property or some statement is true and that the proof has its origins in computations like these, uh, I hope that you believe of what I'm saying is true because of, well, you showed an ex I showed an example just now. Uh, that's the very least I hope for. But what I really hope for is that next time when I say this follows from this and this and this, that you verify this yourself because I truly believe that making such computations yourself is the best way to really master the theory. Okay, with that said, let's have a closer look at the variance. Notice that before I already referred to this particular sigma squared term as uh, the variance, and I did so because when we explicitly compute the variance of a random variable defined relative to this Gaussian distributions, uh, we indeed uh, come to the fact that this variance evaluates to sigma squared. So we're going to show that the variance of x is going to be sigma squared. Okay, so let's compute this thing. We're computing the expected value. So from minus infinity to infinity, we integrate x minus its mean squared weighted with the probability. So weighted with this Gaussian distribution. Again, we're going to simplify this integral by doing the same change of variables. So x minus mu squared will become, uh, let's see, 2 sigma squared y squared. And then we have this front factor. The exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. And the integration measure had this uh, factor 2 sigma squared dy in it. Again, let's uh, factor out these terms. 
So this is the integral that we have to compute. So we're mainly looking at a function that looks like y squared times e to the power e minus y squared. And again, we're going to make use of our mathematical experience in this particular case. I showed it here. We're going to use this convenience trick. This is the integral that we need to compute. And we make this identification that if we have an integral of e to the power uh, minus a x squared, if you take the derivative with respect to a, this x squared pops up in the front and we obtain the integral we are interested in. Now this integral we know how to compute. It evaluates to the square root of pi over a, where this a is sort of obtained via the substitution of variable uh, trick. And then we compute its derivative. So we have a way of actually analytically computing the integral of this thing and it evaluates to a half square root of pi over a to the power three. Now in our particular case, a will be equal to one. And we know then that this integral, so we have this constant over here. And we have the solution of the integral, which is given by a half square root of pi. So we see that this entire variance evaluates to sigma squared. And that's why we call sigma squared the variance of the Gaussian distribution. So let's summarize this. The Gaussian distribution is defined in the following way. It consists of this exponential, which consists of uh, computing the, the square distance of x to mu. And this is scaled with the sigma parameter. So mu determines the location of the maximum and sigma makes it wider or smaller. And this is a normalization uh, factor that makes sure that this distribution integrates to one if we integrate over the random variable. Uh, then we showed that indeed if a variable x uh, is drawn from such a distribution, then the expected value of x is given by mu. So that's the mean parameter and the variance is given by sigma squared. Finally, I, I would like to point out that uh, the Gaussian distribution is also defined in the multivariate case. So if we're dealing with multidimensional vectors. So now my x consists of all these components x1 up to xd. So I have a column vector of uh, variables. Now the Gaussian distribution takes almost the exact same form, except now um, we have, well, that the, that the mean is also a vector and the sigma becomes a matrix, a covariance matrix. So what you see here, if you're familiar with, with geometry, this looks like a Riemannian metric where we scale the distance between x and mu with some uh, anisotropic metric. And here we have this factor that makes sure that this uh, distribution integrates to one. And actually there is a vertical line missing here. Now we do not take the square root of sigma, but we take the square root of the determinant of sigma. So the determinant is denoted with this. Okay, so also here we have the parameter mu, which represents the mean. We have this sigma, capital sigma here, which is called the covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix, so really this sigma is the covariance of x with itself. Now this is something we can prove, like we can explicitly compute the covariance with respect to this multivariate Gaussian distribution, just like we did in the previous cases. But this is quite a tedious task. And I would like to refer to chapter 2.3 if you want to get a better understanding of where this covariance uh, comes from. Yeah, now this covariance matrix is a D by D uh, matrix and it determines the shape of the distribution. It can make it anisotropic in one direction and it can make it elongated in one of the other directions. Okay, now also for this case, let's go over some computations that explicitly compute the expected value of x. So we're going to compute this integral over the entire domain Rd of x weighted with this uh, Gaussian. Now we can simplify this integral again by doing a change of variables. Now we simply choose uh, y to be x minus mu. Now in that case, the integral reduces to the integral of over Rd of C y plus mu times this entire distribution. Now there's two things uh, to be said about this. First of all, uh, we're looking at the product of an odd function with this even function. So uh, 
The integration domain is symmetric, so these terms cancel out. So we only need to focus on this mu, which is a constant, and integrating this entire thing. And what we look at here is actually a Gaussian distribution with average with mu zero. So this is really a distribution with some parameters. And we know from Gaussian distributions that they integrate to one if you integrate over uh, the variable, the random variable y in this case. So we know that this thing integrates to one. So that would actually give us the result that the expected value of x is given by mu. Okay, good to know. Also in a multivariate case, the expected value of a random variable x defined relative to this normal or Gaussian distribution is given by this parameter mu. In this video, I will go over one of the most widely used probability distributions out there, namely the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distribution is a parametric distribution which will be used throughout this course to model probability distributions. And in this video, I give the definition of the Gaussian, but we will also use it as an example for explicitly computing the expectation and variance. Uh, the Gaussian distribution, also called often called the normal distribution, hence this n, it's a distribution with respect to a random variable x. And it is parameterized by this mu parameter, which we, refer, which we will refer to as the mean. And we have the sigma squared, which we will refer to as the variance. Uh, now this is what it looks like. It has this front factor, square root of 2 pi sigma squared, and this exponential 1 over 2 sigma squared times x minus mu squared. Okay, so what are we looking at? So we have this mu parameter over here. This mu parameter really determines the location of the maximum of this distribution. Uh, because what we're looking at here is the square distance of our variable x to this mu. And if x is close to mu, then uh, the square distance is close to zero, and then e to the power of zero, um, well, it will be close to one. So if we move further away from mu, this distance will increase, and then we have e to the power minus something very large, so the probabilities will decay to zero if we move away from mu. Now, a sigma squared or sigma determines the width of this distribution. If sigma is very small, then uh, we actually really only consider assigning high probabilities to points that are close to mu. And as soon as we leave the vicinity of mu, this thing will decay to zero because this thing quite rapidly becomes very large. Um, yeah, and if sigma becomes very large, then we get a very wide distribution and then we start um, more equally assign probabilities to all of these values on, on the x-axis. Still, they decay to zero if we move away from mu. Then we're looking at a distribution and distributions are normalized to integrate to one. So if we integrate this distribution with respect to its random variable x, this entire thing should evaluate to one. And that's why we have this correction term up front. So we have a mean parameter. This determines the location of the maximum of this distribution. And we have a variance parameter, which determines the width of this distribution. Now I've been calling this parameter mu the mean of the distribution. And I do this for a reason, because if we actually compute the mean, if we compute the expected value of x, which is random relative to this normal distribution, we can show that this mean becomes mu. So now we have an analytic form of the distribution. Let's actually do this computation. Let's actually compute the expected value. Okay, so this is what we do. We compute the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x weighted by its probability. So multiplied this Gaussian distribution. Now this uh, integral looks quite complicated. It's hard to compute, so we're going to simplify it and we do this via a change of variables. So I'm going to make a clever choice here that significantly reduces uh, this integral. So I choose y is one over the square root of two sigma uh, squared times x minus mu. And I do this because if I insert this in, in the equation, then actually this exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. Uh, 
Of course, we also need to substitute for the other instances of x. So let's see what x should be. This basically defines x to be um, the square root of 2 sigma squared times y plus mu. Okay, so let's plug it in into the equation. Okay, and now also we have to take a look at this integration measure. So let's see, dy dx is given by 1 over 2 sigma squared, uh, the square root of it. So dx has to be square root of 2 sigma squared dy. So we plug it in. Now this already looks a bit more friendly. Uh, we can clean it up. We can get rid of these terms, these factor out. And what we get is, and what we get is the integral of two components really. So we're computing now the integral of uh, two functions. One is an odd function. So this is y times the exponential of uh, minus y squared. So this is an even function. This is an odd function. So this becomes an uneven or an odd function. And we know that if we integrate odd functions from minus infinity to infinity, the left part of the domain cancels out the positive part. So we actually know that this thing, this part of the integral will evaluate to zero. Now that greatly simplifies our uh, integral. Now we only have to look at the integral of e to the power minus uh, y squared. And for this, we're going to make use of this property that this integral evaluates to the square root of pi. So that gives us mu divided by the square root of pi times the square root of pi is mu. Okay, so what I showed is if we actually compute the expected value of x, where x is a random variable relative to, to this Gaussian distribution, which is parameterized by a mu and a sigma squared, we actually obtain that this expected value becomes mu. Now this is quite an exercise, but the main point is that I wanted to show you an example of how to explicitly compute the expected value and show you that given an, an analytic or parametric form of a distribution, we can indeed analytically derive solutions. There's no magic to it, but it does require some mathematical practice. And I show this example because throughout this course, uh, we will work with Gaussian distributions a lot. We will make use of formulas that are based on derivations like these. And the least I hope for is that when the book or me in one of the talks explains that some property or some statement is true and that the proof has its origins in computations like these, uh, I hope that you believe of what I'm saying is true because of, well, you showed an ex I showed an example just now. Uh, that's the very least I hope for. But what I really hope for is that next time when I say this follows from this and this and this, that you verify this yourself. Because I truly believe that making such computations yourself is the best way to really master the theory. Okay, with that said, let's have a closer look at the variance. Notice that before I already referred to this particular sigma squared term as uh, the variance. And I did so because when we explicitly compute the variance of a random variable defined relative to this Gaussian distributions, uh, we indeed uh, come to the fact that this variance evaluates to sigma squared. So we're going to show that the variance of x is going to be sigma squared. Okay, so let's compute this thing. We're computing the expected value. So from minus infinity to infinity, we integrate x minus its mean squared weighted with the probability. So weighted with this Gaussian distribution. Again, we're going to simplify this integral by doing the same change of variables. So x minus mu squared will become, uh, let's see, 2 sigma squared y squared. And then we have this front factor. The exponential becomes e to the power minus y squared. And the integration measure had this uh, factor 2 sigma squared dy in it. Again, let's uh, factor out these terms. So this is the integral that we have to compute. So we're mainly looking at a function that looks like y squared times e to the power e minus y squared. Uh, 
And again, we're going to make use of our mathematical experience. In this particular case, I showed it here. We're going to use this convenience trick. This is the integral that we need to compute. And we make this identification that if we have an integral of e to the power uh, minus a x squared, if you take the derivative with, with respect to a, this x squared pops up in the front and we obtain the integral we are interested in. Now this integral we know how to compute. It evaluates to square root of pi over a, where this a is sort of obtained via the substitution of variable uh, trick. And then we compute it, its derivative. So we have a way of actually analytically computing the integral of this thing, and it evaluates to a half square root of pi over a to the power three. Now in our particular case, a will be equal to one. And we know then that this integral, so we have this constant over here, and we have the solution of the integral, which is given by a half square root of pi. So we see that this entire variance evaluates to sigma squared. And that's why we call sigma squared the variance of the Gaussian distribution. So let's summarize this. The Gaussian distribution is defined in the following way. It consists of this exponential, which consists of uh, computing the, the square distance of x to mu, and this is scaled with the sigma parameter. So mu determines the location of the maximum and sigma makes it wider or smaller. And this is a normalization factor that makes sure that this distribution integrates to one if we integrate over the random variable. Uh, then we showed that indeed, if a variable x uh, is drawn from such a distribution, then the expected value of x is given by mu. So that's the mean parameter and the variance is given by sigma squared. Finally, I, I would like to point out that uh, the Gaussian distribution is also defined in a multivariate case. So if we're dealing with multidimensional vectors. So now my x consists of all these components x1 up to xd. So I have a column vector of uh, variables. Now the Gaussian distribution takes almost the exact same form, except now um, we have well, that the, that the mean is also a vector and the sigma becomes a matrix, a covariance matrix. So what you see here, if you're familiar with, with geometry, this looks like a Riemannian metric where we scale the distance between X and mu with some uh, anisotropic metric. And here we have this factor that makes sure that this uh, distribution integrates to one. And actually there is a vertical line missing here. Now we do not take the square root of sigma, but we take the square root of the determinant of sigma. So the determinant is denoted with this. Okay, so also here we have the parameter mu, which represents the mean. We have this sigma, capital sigma here, which is called the covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix, so really the sigma is the covariance of x with itself. Now this is something we can prove, like we can explicitly compute the covariance with respect to this multivariate Gaussian distribution, just like we did in the previous cases. But this is quite a tedious task. And I would like to refer to chapter 2.3 if you want to get a better understanding of where this covariance uh, comes from. Yeah, now this covariance matrix is a D by D uh, matrix and it determines the shape of the distribution. It can make it anisotropic in one direction and can make it elongated in one of the other directions. Okay, now also for this case, let's go over some computations that explicitly compute the expected value of X. So we're going to compute this integral over the entire domain RD of X weighted with this uh, Gaussian. Now we can simplify this integral again by doing a change of variables. Now we simply choose uh, y to be x minus mu. Now in that case, the integral reduces to the integral of over rd of let's see, y plus mu times this entire distribution. Now there's two things uh, to be said about this. First of all, uh, we're looking at the product of an odd function with this even function. So uh, the integration domain is symmetric, so these terms cancel out. So we only need to focus on this mu, which is a constant, and integrating this entire thing. 
And what we look at here is actually a Gaussian distribution with average with mu zero. So this is really a distribution with some parameters. And we know from Gaussian distributions that they integrate to one if you integrate over uh, the variable, the random variable y in this case. So we know that this thing integrates to one. So that would actually give us the result that the expected value of x is given by mu. Okay, good to know. Also in the multivariate case, the expected value of a random variable x defined relative to this normal or Gaussian distribution is given by this parameter mu. Now that we have the most important definitions in place, let's start actually using them for machine learning. In this video, I'll explain the maximum likelihood principle, which is a widely used technique for optimizing model parameters. I'll give an example of how the maximum likelihood principle uh, leads to a probabilistic interpretation of least squares regression. Okay, now the premise is as follows. We're dealing with the data set of n independent observations. And we are set out to recover uh, the, the, the probability distribution that may have generated this data set. We're going to model this distribution with a set of parameters. This distribution is called the likelihood of the data set. This is a distribution with respect to the data variable, right? Because every time I may observe a different data set and this probability distribution gives us the probability or the likelihood of this particular data set. And it is conditioned on a set of parameters W. Now the maximum likelihood principle is then as follows. It says that the most likely explanation of D is given by the set of model parameters which maximizes the likelihood function. So let's write this out in equations. So we're looking for the set of parameters, the argmax. We're looking for the set of parameters which optimizes this function, the likelihood function. Now I made this remark before, but I, I want to stress this again. This probability distribution, it is a distribution with respect to D, with respect to the data variable, but it is a function with respect to W. And that's why we call it a likelihood function. Okay, so this is what we set out to optimize. And um, in doing so, we may, we're going to make uh, some assumptions. We're going to assume that the data is independent, identically uh, distributed, which means basically that each data point x, y is independently distributed, is independently distributed according to the same distribution. So the same distribution refers to this uh, identically part of IID, independent, identically distributed. So our assumption is that each data point X is drawn from the same distribution, which is parameterized by a set of uh, parameters W. Now we make this assumption because then uh, the joint probability distribution, so the joint probability with respect to each of these data points uh, factorizes into this product of all the individual probabilities. And this is written out as follows. Okay, so we're going to optimize the maximum likelihood function. Now let's take a look at this thing. It consists of the product of all of these individual likelihoods, all of these individual probabilities. And these probabilities typically have values smaller than one. So the product of all of these uh, values will eventually lead to a very small value. Uh, so if we design numerical, numerical algorithms around this, we can expect numerical underflow errors. So, how are we going to deal with this thing? How are we going to maximize this? Well, instead of optimizing the likelihood directly, we're going to optimize the log likelihood instead. So before I'll explain this, just let, I'm, I'm going to write this out to see what we're talking about. So we're going to find the set of parameters that maximize the log of this likelihood. Now we know from the rules of working with logarithms that the logarithm of a product of all these items decomposes into the sum of their uh, logarithms. So this is key. So the, the log likelihood then becomes the sum 
overall the log of the individual likelihoods. Now, why are we allowed to do this? Uh, first of all, I mentioned that uh, the, taking the logarithm, the logarithm is a monotonically increasing function. It will not change the location of the optima. And I can quickly prove that this is the case. So um, consider what we're doing here. We're finding the, the, the set of values w that optimize this function. And we know that we've reached an optimum whenever the derivative with respect to these par parameters is zero, right? If we have some function of w, so this is a function of w, we know that the optimum at the optimal location, d, dw of f is zero. Okay, so this is the criterion. And we're going to solve this and then we find uh, a value for w and for this particular value of w we know we are at a local optimum. Now let's, get, now let's consider the optimization of the log likelihood. So this tells us that we have a criterion that the derivative of w of the log of the likelihood has to be zero. Now let's use, use the chain rule here. here. Let's write this out. So the derivative of the log gives me one over the thing inside the log times uh, the derivative of the thing inside the log, which is the likelihood. So this is the criterion that needs to be satisfied for uh, optima, for optimal values for W. Now, we know that uh, this particular term over here, one over the likelihood, will always be some positive value. So this will never become zero. So it doesn't contribute to the location of the optimal value for, for W. So we see that this is actually the constraint that has to be satisfied. So we conclude that optimizing the log likelihood gives us the same value for W as optimizing the likelihood. And optimizing the log likelihood is much more convenient because now I have to deal with a sum of all these uh, well, log likelihoods instead of a product of all these small values. And this is much more convenient to work with, especially when we model our likelihood or our probabilities using Gaussian functions, as we will see uh, soon. Now, a final remark to be made here. Uh, typically, we consider the minimization of error functions rather than the maximization of some uh, criterion. So uh, the corresponding error function that we want to minimize would then, of course, be uh, the negative log likelihood. So optimizing or maximizing the log likelihood corresponds to minimizing the negative log likelihood. Okay, so let's do this. Let's, let's compute the log likelihood. Now we're going to model our data distribution with a Gaussian distribution. Right, we've encountered the Gaussian dist distribution before. We made the assumption of IID. So this means that uh, my probability distribution, my joint distribution of x1, x2, etc., conditioned on the model parameters, decomposes to this product of x1 conditioned on the model parameters x2 etc. Okay, now let's actually compute this log likelihood. So remember that the logarithm of a product of items decomposes into the sum of uh, logarithms. So first of all, we have this front factor over here. So that gives us the log of two pi sigma squared d over two, so one over this thing, plus here we have a product of all these exponentials. So that becomes the sum i is 1 to n of the log of these exponentials okay so now we're going to continue using the properties of logarithms remember that if we take uh, the log of x to the power a for example then we can move this power to the front now let's do this uh, first for the, the front factor term. So we recognize that we have one over something. So we can write it as instead as this term to the power minus d over two. And we're going to move this minus 
D, oh sorry, the D should be an N minus minus N over to, and we're going to move the N over to up front. So that gives us minus N over to the log of two pi sigma squared. Now in the sum, we take the log of this exponential. So these cancel each other out. So this gives me the sum over minus one over two sigma squared xy minus mu squared. Okay, so this actually looks quite nice. This is something we can work with. So what we're now going to do, we have now this expression for the log likelihood, and we're going to optimize over its model parameters. And we do so by setting the derivative with respect to one of those parameters to zero. So the derivative of the log likelihood Given the model parameters, we set this to zero, then we solve for mu, and this would give us the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean. So let's actually do this starting with the model parameter mu. So we just derived this expression for the log likelihood. Now let, let's write this out. This term doesn't depend on mu, so it becomes zero, it's derivative. So we focus on this term. Uh, we note that the derivative d d mu of x y minus mu squared is two times x i minus mu. Okay, so let's use this. So it tells us that the derivative is equal to one over two sigma squared. It's a constant, it isn't affected. Y is one n times two x y minus mu. And the optimization uh, criterion is then that this derivative has to be zero. So let's solve for this. Um, well, these factors do, they factor out. Okay, so this thing has to equal uh, zero. This thing is uh, the sigma squared is some positive uh, value thing. So we have to find the constraint where this sum equals zero. So solving this problem is equivalent to solving the sum y is one to n xy minus mu equals zero. Now let's uh, move this xi part, let's move this xi part to the other side. So we have, so we actually sum y1 to n mu equals. So, um, yeah, so we, we take a sum over some constant uh, mu value. It doesn't depend on the index y. So actually what we're doing here, we're counting n times the parameter mu is equal to this thing. So we see that mu is given by one over n times the sum over all data elements. And this is known as the sample mean. So we just showed that if we compute the maximum likelihood solution for the mean parameter, we actually obtain the sample mean. Okay, so we analytically derived the, the maximum likelihood solution from mu and it is given by the sample mean. Now we can also derive an analytic solution to the maximum likelihood for sigma squared. So let's do this. Now we differentiate with respect to sigma squared, and we set this differential to zero. So let's see, we have first have this term. So we take the log, the derivative of this uh, log. So then let's write the front factor, one over the thing inside the log, because that's a derivative. And then uh, times the derivative of, this is a chain rule, times the derivative of what's inside this log. With respect to two, uh, with respect to sigma squared, that gives me two pi. Then we look at this, uh, at the sec second term, so we take, actually we take the derivative here of one over two sigma squared. So this would give me minus one over two sigma to the power four. Okay, so let's write this out. So this minus becomes a plus and we have one over two sigma to the power four times this sum, which does not depend on sigma. And this thing has to be set to zero 
in order for uh, in order for satisfying this optimality uh, criterion. Okay, let's uh, again simplify this thing. So these two pi factors factor out. Um, we have this two sigma squared over here, two sigma to the power four. So we're going to multiply with sigma to the power four to get rid of these um, of frac to get rid of these fractions. So we multiply with um, two sigma to the power four. So that gives me n sigma squared plus the sum and this has to equal zero. Okay, now let's rearrange terms. So we move uh, this part to the other side and we multiply with minus one over n which gives us that sigma squared is one over n, the sum, the sum of the square distance of each point to its mean. And this is known as the sample variance as we have defined uh, in one of the previous uh, videos. Okay, so we see that uh, the maximum likelihood solution for the variance is simply given by the sample variance. So given the data, we were looking for a set of parameters that would give us a Gaussian distribution, which would give the most likely explanation of the data. And we did so by optimizing the log likelihood. And this gives us the maximum likelihood estimators for the mean and the variance parameters. And we showed that the solutions were actually given by the sample mean and the sample variance respectively. Now let's do a sanity check. Suppose we actually know the distribution that generated the data samples. So Suppose I draw multiple data sets. Uh, data set one consists of, well, n of these observations. And I have another data set two, which also consists of n observations. And we say that this data set is drawn from a known Gaussian distribution. And, it's, and it looks like this. Now note that the maximum likelihood estimates of the parameters are a function of the data, right? I could, for example, compute the maximum likelihood solution for mu simply as the sample mean over the data points in my observed data set. So that means that every data set generates a particular estimate for the mu. Now we know the distribution where the data comes from. So we say it comes from this distribution. So we can actually compute the expected value of the, the maximum likelihood estimates. And ideally, these should, of course, coincide with the parameters of the true distribution itself. So let's check that. Let's do a sanity check. Okay, so what would the expected value be uh, if we consider the data as my random uh, variable? We compute the expectation over all these uh, possible data sets uh, for the, uh, the mu parameter. So that would mean that I compute the expected value of the sample mean given over here. So let me write that. Let me write that out. So I can take the sum and the front factor outside. So that's one over n. The sum y is one to n. Expected value over the data points. Of x i. Now remember that each data set gives me a particular value for x y, and all these uh, data samples x y are identically distributed. So what I'm computing here is one over n, this sum y is one to n, of the expected value of these uh, data points, where each data point was drawn from the same uh, distribution. Well, and uh, the expected value of this thing is given by the model parameter mu, so, so we see that we are actually computing the mean of mu, which is simply mu. Okay, so this is good news. It means that I, if I observe all of these data sets, then uh, the expectation over all these data sets of my maximum likelihood estimator actually gives me the true mean. So that actually means that, my, uh, that the bias of the x estimator is zero. Here I note that uh, we call the bias of an estimator the difference it makes uh, with the true uh, value that it's trying to uh, predict. And in this case, 
we have zero bias, so it is an unbiased estimator. So now let's also do this um, sanity check for uh, the variance parameter and compute the expected value over all my data sets of this um, maximum likelihood estimator for the variance. Let's uh, rewrite it a bit by moving this term to the front. I already did some pre-computations to speed things up, so there it is. And this term, and let's also expand the quadratic form in here. So that tells us that I'm going to need to compute the expected value of these three separate terms. Um, again, making use of the linearity of the expected value, I can split this into computing three separate expected values. And I take these sums outside. Now, this term consists of all these expected values of x, y squared, uh, x, y, x, n. Now, we actually have a way of computing these expected values. We've seen them before. Namely, we've seen the term, um, the expected value of x, i squared in the definition of the variance. Uh, if I take the variance of x, y, or differently put, I compute the covariance between x, y, and itself. This is given by the expected value x, y squared minus the expected value of x, y, and this thing squared. And we know that the variance of my random variable, which is distributed uh, via this Gaussian, is given by sigma squared. We also know that the expected value of, of x, y is given by mu. So this thing over here becomes mu squared, and this tells us that the expected value of x, y squared is given by sigma squared plus mu squared. So let's write this, let, let's mark this down. So the expected value of x, y times x, j in the case of y being equal, equal to j is mu squared plus sigma squared. Okay, now let's make some space. Let's put this aside so we remember where it came from. Now the expected value between uh, of the product of two uh, random variables can be derived from the covariance. So let's do this. So the covariance between x, y and x, j is given by the expected value of x, y times x, j minus the expected value of x, y times the expected value of x, j. And we know that this covariance is zero because all the data points were independent. These, these uh, random variables were independently distributed, but they were distributed with the same distribution, which had uh, an expected value or a mean mu. So this tells us that the expected value of x, y, x, j is given by mu squared. So let's mark this down. The expected value is mu squared in the case that y is unequal to j, because then uh, we're dealing with two independent random variables. Okay, now let's make some space. We move this over here to remember where we got this uh, expression from. Okay, so let's write this out. We have one over n, the sum over all these i's. The expected value of x, y always gives me uh, mu squared plus sigma squared. Then uh, we have minus 2n times, uh, then if we look at this thing, this is a sum over expected value. And so it will generate a mu term for every item in this uh, sum. So we have n times mu squared, but only when i is equal to j, so only when this i equals this n, and this happens only one times, uh, one time I get the sigma term in it, so we have plus sigma squared. Okay, so those were the items in, in this uh, particular item. And we do this also for this one. So we have plus 1 over n squared. And then in this entire sum, I get over n over n. So I get n squared times, I encounter the term mu squared, but only n times I count sigma square. Okay, now let's collect collect terms. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to know that um, this entire sum does not depend on the index y. So this part is just taking the average, so it can be uh, omitted. So we see 
let's see, we have these mu terms cancel out. And we have sigma squared. We have sigma squared minus one over sigma squared. And this equals n minus one over n sigma square. Okay, so we see that if we compute the expected value over all these data set of my predicted uh, variance of the maximum likelihood prediction for the variance, I actually obtain that it is given by a fraction of the true variance. So my predicted variance is slightly smaller than my true variance. So this means that I have a biased predictor. Okay, so this is what we did. Uh, we modeled our data. We said that our data come from this Gaussian distribution with some uh, mean mu and variance sigma squared. And then we looked at what the expected value would be of my predictors, of my maximum likelihood estimates. We showed that the maximum, li maximum likelihood estimate actually gives an underestimation of the true variance. Now we could of course define then an unbiased variance estimator that corrects for this term given by n over n minus one times our maximum likelihood estimator, which would then be given by uh, one over n minus one times the sum over each uh, squared distance of the data points to uh, the mean. And now if I were to compute the expected value of sigma tilde squared, I would actually obtain the true variance. Okay, so this would give me an unbiased, uh, an unbiased estimator of the variance. Now we can gain a bit more intuition for how this can happen. So let's say our data comes from this green distribution over here and we sample two points of it. Let's say these two blue points. Well, then I can make an estimation of the distribution and it will probably look something like this. So it's a Ga so I'm fitting a Gaussian to these two data points and the average of the Gaussian is corresponding with the sample mean and the variance corresponds to the sample variance. So I have this actually an under uh, estimation of the, the true variance, but still this is the best fit I can do. Now, if I were to sample again two points and make my estimates for the average, and for the variance, I would get this best fitted or most likely distribution that explains these data points. And finally, if I do this a third time, I would maybe get these two data points sampled and my sample mean would be over here and my variance over here. Now, if I were to compute the expected value of, uh, of the means, then I have a mean over here, here and here, and, and the mean over all these maximum likelihood predictions for the mean would then correspond actually with the true um, mean of the distribution. But if I would take the mean over all these variances, I would take the mean over all these small variances and would get an underestimation of uh, the true variance. Now we just derived uh, the maximum likelihood principles and gained some first intuition. Now let's move towards a more machine learning uh, setting where we want to come up with a predictive model given a particular data set. What we're dealing with now is data that consists of input-output pair, input-output pairs, or input-target pairs. And we denote this with x uh, boldface t. Now we assume that our data is uh, generated via the following model. So we assume that there exists some direct relation between x and the target values t, um, which is modeled by some model parameters w. Uh, but what we actually measure is, um, well, this true behavior, plus some measurement noise. And this measurement noise will be assumed to be a normal distributed uh, with variance one, and we scale it with sigma. So actually the noise is assumed to be, uh, to have variance uh, defined by sigma squared. Okay, so this on the right hand side is what the data looks like. We have all these input output pairs. We assume that these are generated from this true relation given by the red curve. And this is what we want to recover uh, but we measure noise, so we see that the data points are centered around this red curve. So we can think of the data of as a, a random variable with some uh, probability distribution, where the probability reflects the uncertainty in the data related to this measurement noise. 
Um, we're also going to define a so-called precision parameter. This is called precision, and it is defined defined as the inverse of the variance, right? If I have a large variance, then I have small precision. If my variance is small, then I have a high precision. Okay, so with this in place, we're going to model uh, the target distribution. So we're going to model the probabilities of these target values with a normal distribution with respect to the random variable t, which is centered around what we model to be the true target values. and which has some uh, uncertainty, some variance to it. Okay, so this is going to be our model for the predictive distribution. And then we're going to maximize the likelihood of the data uh, given my model parameters. So this means uh, we have some uh, model parameters, these Ws and this precision uh, beta. So I could, for example, construct a model, a probability distribution over here but if I check for the data points, well, the probability of this data being generated by this model is close to zero. So this is probably not a very good, good model. I could decide to um, place the model right over the, over the mean, but with a very large variance. So that means, uh, yeah, my, my, the likelihood is increased because now these, these data points, they indeed have a higher probability, but still, um, the distribution is a bit flat, so I also consider, also assign probabilities to all these points that I never encounter. So this will give us a reasonable likelihood, uh, but it's probably not uh, that accurate. Okay, so now I can choose my, my model parameters as to optimize the likelihood, and I hope that I recover the true uh, underlying uh, data distribution. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to optimize the log likelihood and the log of the likelihood, uh, the log of this normal distribution or Gaussian distribution is given in the following way. We derived this before. So it consists of this quadratic term and this was the front factor in front of this uh, exponential. Okay, so in machine learning, we typically talk about minimizing some error functions. So we're going to minimize the negative log likelihood res with respect to the model parameters W and precision beta. Now, this error function consists of this quadratic term in which I'm going to find uh, the values for W that best model the true behavior. So which best map each input pair to the corresponding output pair. So this is a regression problem where we want to minimize uh, the mean squared error. And these terms uh, come from the front factor where particularly this term still depends on our precision parameter. This is one of our model parameters. Now we have methods to actually compute uh, the optimal value for W, which minimizes this mean squared error function, right? Because the rest doesn't depend on W. So the optimal maximum likelihood uh, parameter for W is given by the minimization of this uh, mean squared error. Now the beta term pops up over here and over here. Now remember that this error function is optimized when uh, the derivative with respect to that parameter that you optimize over is set to zero. So um, let's quickly do that for the beta parameter. So the derivative of this thing is given by a half and then the sum of my model, the squared distance to ti. The derivative of this log is given by uh, minus n over two to one inverse, and this has to equal uh, to zero. So if we multiply everything with uh, minus two over n and move this to the other side, we actually obtain that the maximum likelihood solution for beta or for the variance is given by uh, this thing. And this looks a lot like uh, the sample variance. So given our modeling choices, so we chose to model the data with a Gaussian distribution, we are able to obtain maximum likely estimates uh, for this distribution that uh, well ep that optimizes the likelihood of the data uh, coming from a model with these parameters. Now this actually gives us a predictive distribution. Instead of for every point x0 just predicting one value, we actually have a distribution that assigns probability of the target being a particular value. 
So our predicted distribution is a Gaussian distribution over t with its mean given by my model, the maximum likelihood estimate of this model, and the precision given by the maximum likelihood estimate of the precision. So for every data point, I place uh, probabilities on all possible target values. Uh, now, if I want to give a point estimate, like I only want to return one uh, target value, the most probable target value, I could take the expected value over this uh, predictive distribution. And, that, and since this predictive distribution is a Gaussian, this expected value would give me simply this model Y modeled by the maximum likelihood uh, parameters. So for this point prediction, I only need the maximum likelihood solution for W and the maximum likelihood solution to W was simply give, given by this least squares optimization problem. In the previous video, we discussed a way for fitting probability distributions to observed variables. And we chose to model such distributions with Gaussians and tested for the likelihood that the data was generated by this model. We then chose the model parameters that optimized this likelihood and this approach was called maximum likelihood optimization. This was an important first step uh, in moving towards a more probabilistic and Bayesian approach to data modeling. Now in this video, we move one step further into this uh, Bayesian direction and consider to optimize parametric distributions via the principle of maximizing the posterior probability for the model weights given the observed data samples. I will now introduce the maximum posterior approach. So let's take a look what we did in the previous video. We have this set of observed uh, data samples, um, x1 to xn. And then in the maximum likelihood approach, uh, we said, okay, we're going to model this distribution. We're going to say that this data was drawn from some distribution which we model with model parameter w's. And this basically gives me a likelihood of the data, um, well, the likelihood for the data given my model parameters. What we then did, we were simply going to maximize this likelihood and find the parameters that maximize this likelihood. So now in the maximum a posteriori case, we're going to uh, consider optimizing the posterior of the weights giving my data. So now we're going to look at this distribution, the distribution for the weights given my data. And I'm going to maximize this. So I'm going to maximize the posterior probabilities because this thing over here is called the posterior distribution. It is a distribution for, uh, it assigns probabilities for my model uh, parameters uh, given that I've observed, so after I observed my data. So we see that now we're going to change few points, right? Because initially we considered distributions over my data, which were parameterized uh, by my weights w. So actually what we were optimizing over was a function, a function of w, uh, because d was fixed. And now we're going to change viewpoints and now we consider uh, the probability as a distribution over the weights given my observed data points. So we're going to uh, change viewpoints and we can do this using Bayes' theorem as we have seen uh, in one of the previous videos and uh, as we will see in uh, the next slide. Okay, so now consider again this regression case. So we have a data, we have observation that came in the form of input target pairs, input target, and this is denoted by the vector of input values and the vector of uh, corresponding target values. Then uh, we modeled uh, such data being generated uh, via a normal distribution whose mean was given by, uh, well, my true model. Uh, so Y models the relation between X and the target and it's modeled by a W parameter. So we say the target is centered around this prediction, but there's some noise associated with, associated with it. So my target values, they have some noise on it. And we modeled this probability distribution to be a normal or a Gaussian distribution. And this is the form of it, right? So we have this front factor and this exponential. Then in this maximum likelihood approach, we chose W such that the data likelihood is maximized. So we maximized the likelihood 
and we show that this corresponds to maximizing the log of the likelihood because taking the log of the things of the thing which you optimize over doesn't change the location of the optima. Now a similar thing we are going to do also for the maximum a posterior case. Now we're not optimizing over uh, the likelihood but now we are optimizing over the posterior probabilities given my observed data and uh, given my uh, modeling parameter. So we here optimize over the posterior. Now we are going to recover the posterior probability uh, for uh, the weights W uh, using Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem requires us to have access to a likelihood function. Well, we have that. And uh, we require a prior. And basically this prior encodes my prior knowledge or assumption on what these weights should look like. So I have an idea that uh, maybe some weights are more probable than others. And I'm going to model this with this prior probability distribution. And this probability distribution can be parameterized by an, an, an additional parameter alpha. Uh, we'll see an example soon. Now given that, uh, the posterior distribution is derived from the likelihood of my data given my model parameters uh, w and my uh, precision parameter uh, beta. Times my uh, prior probability, which is conditioned on some, uh, some parameter alpha. So we have here the likelihood times the prior, and, and this is normalized with the evidence. Okay, so Bayes' theorem gives us a way for uh, converting my uh, prior knowledge in combination with the likelihood. So we have the likelihood of the data given my model parameters and I have a prior on my model parameters. And this is a normalization constant, which could be rewritten in terms of what we see here in the numerator. We saw that in one of the previous videos. Now, when we optimize uh, with over W, uh, we are only really interested in the terms in the numerator because this thing doesn't depend on W. So, so we often write that um, the posterior is proportional to uh, the likelihood times the prior. Okay, so let me write this, that down. This term does not depend on W. So that's why we often omit it. Okay, so we set out to maximize the posterior. So that's what we see over here. And also in this case, uh, it is convenient to work with the log of the posterior. So this is equivalent to optimizing over the log of the posterior probability. And this is the case because the log doesn't change the location of the optimal values for W. Now using Bayes' theorem, we could write the posterior in, in terms of a product of a likelihood with a prior uh, divided by the evidence. Now um, with this log, these products splits into a sum of these three separate terms. So we see that we're actually optimizing over, let's try that out. We take the arc max with respect to W of the log of the likelihood. plus the log of the prior. Minus the log of the evidence. Now we already saw that this uh, evidence doesn't depend on W. So what we're really optimizing over is uh, these two terms. So we take the arc max of the log likelihood plus the log of the prior. And this gives us the maximum a posteriori uh, estimate for W. Okay, now we also have to deal with a model for the prior. So we're going to model the prior distribution also with a Gaussian distribution because these Gaussians are convenient to work with as we have uh, seen so far. And what is typically done is that you assume that the weights uh, that describe our model, let's say we have M of these weights, uh, we assume that 
the values for each of these individual weights, weights is close to zero. So that's my prior um, assumption that my weights shouldn't be too large. They should be close to zero. Um, but I put some uncertainty on their value. I mean, they can deviate from zero. And so I have this precision parameter that allows me to change my prior uh, prior belief of these, these weights with some uh, precision parameter alpha. Okay, so I can do this. Um, I also assume that the weights are uncorrelated, so they're independent of each other. So this joint probability on the weights um, is split into this product of all these individual priors for each of the individual weights. So I can write this out. Um, so I assumed a Gaussian distribution, so that gives me a front factor of alpha divided by 2 pi to the power m over 2 times uh, the product of all these uh, exponentials e to the power minus alpha over 2 w i w i. Now we also know that uh, the product of all these exponentials uh, we can also just sum uh, their powers uh, which makes it look maybe a bit more friendly, so let's do that. So we still have this front factor, alpha over 2 pi to the power m over 2, times this exponential now to the power minus alpha over 2, and then the sum of i of all these wi times wi. And now it's actually more convenient to, to, to switch back to uh, this a vector notation. So we have a vector of all these w's and what we see here is really an inner product, right? So we see the sum over the coefficients uh, squared. So maybe it's more convenient to write here w transpose w. Okay, so this is the form that my uh, prior takes. So this is my model for the prior. It's a multivariate Gaussian distribution with zero mean and some variance or some precision on um, what values these uh, w's can take. Okay, now let's plug this into our optimization framework. Uh, we set out to maximize the posterior, uh, but often we prefer to talk in terms of minimizing some error function. So uh, the equivalent problem is minimizing the negative log of the posterior. So we minimize uh, the negative log of the posterior which split into this uh, likelihood term and this prior term. We saw that over here, we have this likelihood term and the prior term, and this term doesn't contribute to the solution. Now let's purely focus on uh, the prior term. So the maximum a posteriori solution for w is found by uh, the arc min with respect to w of the negative log likelihood. I'm just going to leave it for what it is for the moment. minus the log of the prior. So we're going to take the logarithm of this thing and I'm going to ignore this term because it doesn't depend on w. And then the log of this exponential would give us actually minus, so this becomes a plus, plus alpha over two w transpose w. So what we see here is that the maximum a posterior estimate is given by minimizing uh, the log likelihood plus some extra error term that penalizes uh, the weights in a quadratic way. Okay, so we just derived uh, the log of the, the prior, that's this thing over here, that's, it's a quadratic penalty, and now we're going to insert the log of the likelihood. And the likelihood for an individual data sample was given by this thing, the likelihood of the entire data set is given by uh, the product of all uh, these items. So. Um, that's what I'm going to take the log of, of the product of all these things. And I'm going to ignore the front factor. And that would give us, give us actually the log of the likelihood is given by the sum over all my data sa uh, samples weighted by beta over 2. So this uh, minus disappears because I'm taking the min, uh, the negative log likelihood. And then of this term, t minus y x w squared. So we see that uh, the maximum a posteriori estimate for uh, w is given by this least squares problem 
which is regularized with some uh, quadratic penalty on W. Now, similar as in uh, the maximum likelihood case, we were modeling the data to be uh, distributed according to this predictive uh, distribution. So for a fixed X, I obtain a distribution for um, the possible target values. And this distribution was param parameterized now via the optimal uh, solution for W. So in our case, this predictive distribution then is, is parameterized or is modeled with a Gaussian of the random variable T, which has a mean which is centered around my, uh, well, my model's uh, prediction, and which has some precision or variance associated. And this variance is now also modeled. It's still an, a free parameter in, a, in, in this entire model. So with this predictive distribution, we can say, given uh, a particular input X, I can assign probabilities to, uh, the cross to, to some target values. So I'm not going to make decision what the exact target value is. I can only say what is the most likely target value. And if you want a point estimate, I can give you a point estimate. Then let's choose the expected value um, of uh, this random variable T relative to this uh, predictive distribution. And the expected value of a Gaussian is given by its mean. And its mean is given by this model, which takes an input X and transforms it in a way that is parameterized by my obtained uh, maximum a posteriori estimates uh, W. So we saw that both uh, the maximum likelihood approach as well as the maximum posterior approach provide ways to um, come up with predictive distributions. In the maximum likelihood approach, my estimates were given uh, via a least squares problem, the solutions to the least squares problem, and in the maximum posterior case, uh, the, the most probable weights were given via a regularized least squares problem. In the previous uh, videos, I already talked a bit about some models being more Bayesian than others. And I realized that I haven't really explained what I mean with things being Bayesian. Essentially, uh, a, a modeling approach is, is considered Bayesian if it relies on a consistent applications of the sum and product rules of probability. And we want to work in a Bayesian setting because this allows us to deal with uncertainties uh, on, at all levels of, of my uh, modeling uh, task. Uh, for example, we saw that in the maximum likelihood and maximum posterior approach, we already uh, dealt with uncertainty on my target values by working with predictive distributions. Now, in the maximum posterior case, we also assumed a prior on my model parameter on my model parameters, so that actually already gives us some uncertainty over my model choices. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, we made a point estimate for for the most probable uh, model, and we worked with this pr set of parameters in our predictive distributions. Now, in our Bayesian approach, we do not dare to make one of such. Uh, decisions on the models, but we want to also incorporate uh, these um, uncertainties on uh, the model parameters in our predictions. Uh, we'll see in a minute how we do this, uh, but this essentially leads to a fully Bayesian approach to prediction. Okay, so the setting is again, we have a data set of observations, of independent observations, and we want to model uh, this data set with some probability distribution as to be able to make predictions for the future. So um, this data set could consist of input, uh, of just input points, but maybe also target values, uh, corresponding target values. And then our goal was to, um, in, in the future, we want to make predictions. So uh, let's say we, have, we are given some input X and we want to predict now for this new data point, what would be the corresponding uh, data point? And we define these probabilities for each of these uh, targets. And such a predictive distribution was parameterized by a set of weights uh, W and maybe some precision parameter beta. Then we discussed two approaches for finding these optimal estimates for W. One was the maximum likelihood approach in which we selected the model parameters W which maximized the likelihood of the data well, being explained by this particular model. In the, the map case, we instead maximize the model parameters. So the, we chose the parameters that maximized the probability of these weights 
um, given my, my data. And these two approaches are considered frequentist approaches because I discard any uncertainty uh, regarding W. I just pick one of the most optimal choices for W. So I just make a point estimate for my model parameter W. Now in a Bayesian approach, we want to include this uncertainty over my model parameters. Um, so we have a given prior belief over W. So this uh, prior distribution P of W and we have a data. And we are really interested in actually working with this posterior distribution, not just for selecting one particular model, we want to use this. And this posterior distribution was derived from a Bayes theorem. So we could obtain it from uh, the likelihood, so the likelihood of my data being explained by this model um, times the prior uh, belief of this uh, model divided by uh, the data evidence. And this data evidence is essentially the, the probability of my data regardless of my, my model parameters. And it could be obtained, it's considered maybe a normalizing constant, and it actually could be obtained from uh, the terms in the numerator. Okay, now this is important to, to remember. Uh, the, the, the posterior distribution, so the posterior distribution reflects the plausibility of different W given uh, my prior knowledge and the data. Um, so basically this means that some models are more plausible than others. Now recall that um, uh, we work with this prior distribution which represents some prior belief or prior knowledge of the plausibility of W. And in the previous video we actually worked with Gaussian distribution um, in which we assumed that my uh, weights were uh, had small values, they were close to zero, and I could control the amount of variation of these uh, weights with some extra variance parameter uh, alpha, it was in the previous video. And then we could update or uh, believe in this uh, model parameter w, uh, given my data observations, and we could do so using Bayes' theorem, right? So the posterior was given uh, via the product of the likelihood with the prior normalized um, with this evidence. Now the objective in this Bayesian approach is to in incorporate this uh, posterior uh, probabilities for my uh, different model parameters. As, and, and actually we want to come up with a predictive distribution which does not depend on W. So we do not dare to make a particular choice for W. We want to include all well, possible options. And we could actually achieve this via a marginalization process. So recall from uh, the sum rule of probability theory that such um, a distribution which only depends on, well, now one of those random variables could be obtained by integrating out the other one. So we could think of this as a marginalization of the joint probability of X and W given my data. And then we know from uh, the product rule of probability that such a uh, joint distribution can be obtained from a product of two uh, distributions uh, as follows. So we have this joint probability could be obtained as the probability of a particular x given all my data and given my uh, model parameters times the probability of my model parameters conditioned on the data dw. So this is the product rule of probability. And here I should note that actually this is a very odd thing to write. So we see this D over here. So X is apparently conditioned on D, but it isn't. Because we made this assumption that each data point was independent from one another. So also a new observed or a new uh, data point X prime uh, should not depend on my data set D. So actually I don't think I should write this. I should write this. I should write this as follows, namely the integral over the probability of x given my model parameters weighted with my posterior probability. And so basically this says that my predictive distribution, which in the end does not, does not depend on w anymore, is given by a weighted sum or a weighted average of all my um, predictive distribution. So this is one predictive distribution for a particular choice of W, and I'm going to weigh it with its corresponding uh, posterior probability of, well, this thing quantified how plausible my model, my model was for these 
uh, W parameters. Okay, so predictive distributions can be obtained via a marginalization process over W of these joint probability distributions. And now there's a small but important remark that I would like to make, and that is that even though our data set is conditionally independent on the model parameter, this does not imply that the marginal distributions are also independent. And, and I'm going to quickly show that uh, as follows. So we have this uh, conditionally, conditional independence means this. It means that all my data points, um, they are uh, independent from one another, uh, given my, my model parameters. So I could factorize this joint probability distribution of all these xi's into the product of each of these individual uh, distributions. And my data was uh, identically distributed, so it was using the same uh, probability distribution for each of these uh, data points. So here on the left hand side we see this um, marginalized probability distribution on the data. So for example a predictive distribution it was obtained via this marginalization over the joint distribution of the data and the model parameters. And using the product rule of probability we could factorize this joint probability into uh, the product of a likely likelihood and a prior. So let's just write it out. So here I'm doing the marginalization. So I'm integrating over all these W's. Uh, this joint distribution, joint likelihood factorizes into the product of all these individual probabilities. So I have the probability of X1 given my model parameters times P of X2 conditioned on my model parameters, etc. X3, oh, sorry, Xn times the prior and this integrated for all uh, values of uh, the model parameters. Now, if the resulting distribution um, would be a, a, an independent distribution, so that would mean that each of these... Uh, yeah, per, so, so we could split this, joint, this resulting marginal distribution into these product of uh, well, individual marginalizations. We can show that this is not going to be the same. So let's check this. Suppose my marginal would factorize into e each of these uh, sub-marginals. That would mean that I'm going to take the product, the product of each of these probability distributions, where each of these probability distributions could also have been obtained via this marginalization process. Now each x1 or x xi, so let's start with x1, is conditioned on a set of model parameters. So this is the likelihood for x1 given model parameter w1 times um, the prior and this integrated. Uh, we do the same now for the next item. Okay, so this is going to be a product of all these individual uh, marginals. Now we see, because we take all these integrations, uh, we integrate over some W, so these W's are not the same. It's, it's an integration uh, parameter, let's call it the dummy parameter. But the point here is that each of these marginals is obtained via uh, these conditionals, which each have their own priors, each have their own uh, priors and, and corresponding weights. Whereas in our original uh, case, the marginalization over the condi conditionally independent distribution, here each um, likelihood has the same set of, of weights and the same prior. So we see that generally, um, this will not be the same because if indeed this marginal distribution would factorize in such a way, yeah, then we should be able to show uh, how to write this into this form. And we cannot do this in the gen generic case. Uh, maybe we could indeed assume independence of each of these uh, model parameters. That would lead to a factorization of all these. Okay, that's something we, we actually do uh, in, in the map case, for example, in the video, uh, previous video. But then it would also mean that each of these terms uh, correspond to each other. So that x1 only depends, the probability for x1 only depends on one particular parameter w1. And I suppose we can immediately tell that this is not going to happen in the general case because now if we parameterize this with a Gaussian, let's say with only two parameters, um, yeah, I have a mean and a standard deviation and I have n data points. So uh, this will never happen. Okay, so important to remember, marginalizing over conditionally independent distribution will generally or most likely not result in a independent 
distribution in an independent marginal distribution. Okay, now let's continue with uh, how such a Bayesian approach works in practice. So we consider again uh, curve fitting. So we have input output pairs and all these inputs are stacked into one vector and all the targets or all the outputs are also stacked in one vector. And uh, we know that the posterior distribution uh, of my model parameters given my, my data could be obtained by multiplying the likelihood. So the likelihood of a target given well, the corresponding inputs and my model parameters. Um, so we multiply the likelihood with the prior and we normalize over our uh, data evidence. where uh, this is really considered a normalizing uh, constant, which could be obtained by integrating over uh, the things that we see in, in the numerator. Then we're going to use this uh, posterior distribution um, in our predictive distribution. So uh, we will not make a specific choice for a particular W. So in the map maximum a posteriori case, we were selecting the W that optimized this thing, that maximized the probability distribution given my data. But now I'm going to use a marginalization process. So I basically I'm going to consider all possible uh, models weighted with their probability, uh, weighted with their probabilities. So that's what you see over here. So we have a disjoint probability of the targets and my model parameters, and then giving uh, my data set and the input point, which I'm going to test for. So using the product rule of probability, we can show um, that this thing, so this integral by actually integrating over the product of, of two, two items, namely the predictive distribution. So um, let's write it out. So we're going to predict T given my X. So that's what I'm sampling or what I'm testing for. And then given my data and the model parameters times the posterior for the model parameters. And now I want to stress again that uh, we're working with independent data samples. So my T prime, of course, it depends on the corresponding X prime, but it will not depend on the other data samples. So this uh, conditional uh, dependency here does not exist and we never shouldn't write it. So I'm going to write it out. So actually we have the integral of my predictive distribution for a given X and given my model parameters times the posterior on W given the entire data set. Okay, so what we see is that in this Bayesian approach, we will take uncertainty with respect to the model parameters into account. Uh, this uncertainty is sort of reflected by this posterior distribution because I can have multiple models that are highly probable and some are not so probable. And what you do here uh, with this predictive distribution, with this marginalization, you say that you're doing Bayesian model averaging. So you take basically the average over all your predictive distribution over all your models and you weight each model with its, uh, with its probability. Okay, so that's summarized over here. My predictive distribution is obtained as a weighted average of each of these individual uh, probability distributions. Uh, and this relies a lot on the computation of a posterior. So we could obtain the posterior as the product of the likelihood times the prior and then normalized uh, via this uh, data evidence. And now this data evidence has to be computed via this full integral. So basically we normalize this term by integrating over all possible um, model parameters. And this gives me a normalizing uh, constant. Now, an advantage of this uh, Bayesian approach is that now we include prior knowledge. So prior knowledge on the model. And actually this is what we also did with the maximum posterior case where we said, okay, I'm going to model this. I'm going to assume some prior knowledge on my model. Uh, so that's reflected with this prior distribution over here. But in that case, uh, it will be optimized over uh, this posterior and select just one of these W. So the most probable uh, model we selected and this defined our predictive distributions. Uh, but now in this fully Bayesian approach, we do this model averaging and therefore uh, this Bayesian approach re represents not just the uncertainty in T prime. So this was reflected from the fact that we were using predictive distributions. 
But now we also take uncertainty over W into account via this model averaging. Now a possible disadvantage of this approach is that uh, in the computation of this posterior, we actually have to compute uh, this evidence, so this, this integral, and especially this integral is often hard to compute analytically. And we like analytic fun functions because if we know uh, what this thing looks like, we can just evaluate it because we have an analytic description for it. If we do not have it, we have to numer numerically compute these integrals, and also that is often quite difficult. So uh, what people typically do, um, they, they either approximate this or numerically compute somehow uh, this integral. But there are ways to come up with analytic solutions to this. And we already uh, got a preview of that with uh, the map case where we assumed a prior, which was a Gaussian, and also our likelihood was a Gaussian, and then the products of these Gaussians also give you a Gaussian. So when working with Gaussian distributions, it's actually, uh, you can get a long way with uh, finding these analytic solutions. But the disadvantage of this is that actually you're picking your distributions for convenience. Essentially, you can say that uh, we pick a Gaussian because now we have a nice distribution to work with. And actually, in most ways, it is actually well quite appropriate to model your data with Gaussians. Uh, but it sort of implies also a bit that you're picking also the Gaussian before, well, uh, because of mathematical convenience, rather than this is the most accurate model. Okay, but the great thing about Bayesian approaches is that uh, they take uncertainty into account both with respect to uh, the target uh, distributions to, with respect to the predictions and also with respect to the, the model parameters. In this week, we're going to discuss in detail our first supervised machine learning method, namely linear regression. While the first week had a strong focus on probability theory, of which a proper understanding is essential in order to be able to, to deal with uncertainties, uh, but it also gave us a way to formalize uh, when we think a system is optimal or when it is most probable. Uh, we worked in a relatively abstract setting without going into full details of how these models were precisely parameterized. But in this week, we will, we will make things more explicit and explain how to construct and actually compute with linear regression models. Now, in the first two lectures, three principles for probabilistic learning were discussed. We defined optimality criteria for when we consider a probabilistic model to be appropriate. It was either the model that gave the most likely explanation of the data, leading to the maximum likelihood principle, or, or we selected the model that was most probable given the data. This was the maximum a posteriori approach. Um, but we could also go fully Bayesian and define, define the, the predictive distributions to be the weighted average of all possible predictive distributions. Now, central in all cases was that we work with uh, predictive distributions of the following form. So we had some input X and we want to assign probabilities for all uh, possible target values well, given this input X. And we model this uh, via Gaussian distributions or normal distributions, which had the following form. So we had the normal distribution with respect to the random variable T, which was parameterized by some mean and some variance or some uh, inverse precision, right? And uh, where this, this mean actually derived from a modeling approach where we assume there's a, some clear relation between input X and target variable, uh, variable uh, T. But in the previous lectures, we sort of skipped over this part. Uh, so we sort of said, okay, we, there exists such a model and we're going to optimize it using these three principles uh, that I just uh, uh, mentioned, but we didn't uh, go into full details on how to obtain these uh, these actual models y of x parameterized uh, by w. And that's what we're going to do today. Now recall that regression is a machine learning task where we want to make predictions uh, given some input. So we're dealing with the data consists of input output pairs. And in the regression case, these outputs are a continuous uh, variable. So we want to predict some continuous value. So what we're going to do, we we'll consider the input variables to be vectors in 
rd so each input data point is a vector is a d-dimensional vector and now my output i'm going to say that the corresponding output is just going to be some number so i'm only considering scalar uh, target values uh, today but this of course generalizes also to predicting multiple values at the same time okay now let's think of a, a concrete example suppose my task is to predict house prices and I'm given uh, the floor area, I'm given the age or the building uh, year of the house, maybe how big is the garden. So all these uh, parameters can be stacked into one input uh, vector, right? So I have the measurements or variables on which I'm going to base my prediction and my prediction will be the house price. So just one number. Now the simplest linear model I can think of is just assigning weights to each of these uh, input uh, values. So that would be W0, that's a bias term, plus W1 times the first component, plus W2 times the second component, and so on. And I assign a weight to each of these uh, data elements. Now there's some ambiguity that needs to be resolved with respect to these indices. Uh, I noticed that I'm using indices here, uh, an index XI that denotes the i-th data point. So uh, the i data point where each data point was a vector in rd but now here the index refers to the comp component within this vector so let me just quickly clarify this so here the index refers to component within the vector within the d-dimensional vector Right, so uh, I denote a vector with uh, an underscore. So x underscore is a d-dimensional vector. And then without an underscore, this is one component of such a vector. So let's just write this out. So I say that x is a vector um, that looks like this, x1, x2, up to xd. Okay. Um, now, actually, sometimes it may be more convenient to work with this uh, vector form. Actually, quite often it is. So let's just write a simple linear model into this vector form. Then we have a set of weights, which we can um, set to be W1, W2, WD. Okay, let these be our weights and inputs, uh, respectively. Then I can write this linear model. I can write it as my bias plus my w transpose x now i can actually switch to full vector notation because now i still for, sometimes it's convenient to write this fully out as one uh, scalar product now i still have this bias term in here but i could include this bias term in my weight vector so let's do it let's add a zeroed component to s let's denote this with uh, w tilde for example uh, the same for x tilde, but now I'm going to add a 1. And I'm going to do this because then I can write this linear model simply as w tilde transpose x tilde. Right? Because now we have w0 times 1 plus w1 times x1, w2 times x2, etc. And I would then I would obtain my, my linear model. Okay, so... So sometimes we're going to use this extra prepended uh, bias. So we include the bias in the set of, of weights and sometimes we, we treat it separately. It should be clear from context, um, otherwise we mention it. But the main point is here, we have a linear model and a linear model means that I'm just going to take linear combinations of my input vector, where I assign one weight to each uh, vector component. Okay, so let's make a drawing of, of what this uh, could look like. Uh, again, let's talk about predicting house prices. Uh, let's say we have only one measurement, uh, for example, uh, the floor area. So this is my input x, and x is now just uh, some scalar value. And I'm going to predict the house price with it. House price. And now I have all these measurements. So I have this huge data point database of data points, which I already see from this plot, I see that the house price increases with uh, 
well, with the flow area. And now I'm going to make a predictive distribution or a predictive function that describes this process that, that maps each input parameter, so the flow area to the corresponding house price. So I'm going to fit a model to it. Okay, so now uh, I'm considering linear models, so I can only take linear combinations of my input uh, variable with some bias terms. So I have my weights, which looks like um, a weight zero and a weight one. And my input, let's say it consists of this constant one and um, x1, which was the floor area. Now, suppose I would only fit um, the bias term. So uh, that then maybe this is the best I can do. This will be the case that my bias is fitted. So it's unequal to zero, but my linear component, I'm going to set it uh, for zero for, for the time being. Okay, that's, so that's not, not a good fit because it's just constant. Um, let's try a different model. Let's say we only uh, tune the, the W1 parameter, then maybe this is uh, the best I can do. So let's fix my bias and let's tune my W1 uh, parameter. So you see neither of the two is a good fit. So of course we have to fit the full model to it, which is going to be a combination of a linear component. So the slope of this curve and a bias, which enables uh, this, uh, this offset over here. And this, this slope is determined by uh, W1. Okay, so with an appropriate set of uh, weights, I can model this. So I can come up with a model that maps each in input x uh, to a corresponding output given my, my weights. And of course this works well if we indeed have such a linear relation that uh, the prices nicely scale uh, with the floor area. But suppose this isn't the case. Suppose my data looks something like this. So again we have a floor area, we have house prices, and my data points look like this. So like initially my house, pr house prices increase with square meter, but at some point it saturates. I don't know, uh, maybe at some point people cannot afford uh, a house which is too big. So the house prices start to saturate. I think this sort of makes sense. But the point is now, of course I can make a linear model fit. So I could maybe fit something over here, uh, but this would give me a very poor fit in this region. I could, uh, maybe fit on this part, uh, on the saturated part, uh, but that obviously wouldn't describe well uh, this behavior over here. So actually to, ac to be able to ac accurately describe this phenomenon, I'm going to need something better than just a linear model. So actually I want to model this thing over here. Now it turns out that we cannot describe such a model with just taking linear combinations of the input. But what we could do, we could first transform the input to a new set of values, to a new set of, let's say, measurements, and then define a linear model on this. And this would actually give me a way to come up still with linear models of x parameterized by a set of w's that describe this phenomenon. And we're going to do that via basis functions. And I hope I can make this clear in the upcoming uh, slides. So the approach is as follows. We still work with a fixed number of parameters let's denote this with capital M. So I have my weights, my weight factors, of my, or my weight factor is a vector of size M. Now I'm going to choose M minus one basis functions or features of X. So this means I have this phi of X and it returns a new feature. So what does this thing do? Each of these basis functions takes as input a d-dimensional, uh, my input vector, and spits out a new feature value. And we'll see in a minute a bit more concretely uh, what this actually means, well, what these basis functions actually do. Uh, but now I have these basis functions and I have an index i that runs from um, one to m minus one. Then my approximation is going to be as follows. So again, I have this uh, bias term over here Plus, now I'm going to make linear combinations. Uh, so I'm going to assign a corresponding weight to each of these new feature uh, values that were obtained through by pulling these uh, inputs x through this basis uh, function. Okay, so here w0 
is a bias. And now we're going to switch back to, to vector notation. So I'm going to define this thing over here. And this is going to be the connect, well, the, the concatenations of all these newly obtained feature uh, values. So I denote it as this. So this is going to be phi zero, phi one. So I'm really stacking all these new features on top of each other and minus one x this thing transpose it's going it is going to be a column vector now i defined this first basis function is always going to return the value one and by doing so uh, we saw that before uh, by doing so we can incorporate the weights uh, well this bias inside the weight vector and that will give me the following uh, the following formula so now my predictive model is still a linear model that looks like this w transpose and then the scalar product with uh, this newly obtained feature vector, right? So I'm always going to write underscore for uh, for vectors so, because I cannot write boldface. <laughs> That's the, the main reason. Okay, so if I write this out, uh, this thing corresponds to this thing over here, right? So I have W0 times one because my first basis function was always one and I have W1 times well, my first basis function, W2 times the second basis function, and so on. Okay, so we put this in, 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 in vector notation. Now, think again about what kind of objects we're dealing with here. So this thing over here, this phi um, underscore, so this vector uh, phi, it takes as input a data point, which was a d-dimensional uh, vector, and it turns this into an m-dimensional vector. Because each basis function took as input, so each fi took as input this d-dimensional vector and just spit out one new number. And if I stack them on top of each other, I will have m of these uh, new values. So I have a vector of size m. Okay, so this gives me a way to change the dimensionality of my data. So suppose I have only uh, a scalar, let's say floor area, I can turn this into m variations of floor area let's say floor area squared to the power three uh, etc so let's take a look at some options that we have for the corresponding basis functions let's say my basis functions are these projection operators which takes as input the full vector x and projects it to one of its components so the i basis function selects only the i uh, component and in this case the number of basis functions uh, equals the dimensionality of my, my vectors, right? For each component, I have one basis function. And then if I write this out, so this was my formula for my basis function uh, regression model. So I have uh, a bias term plus the sum over these basis functions, where I apply this weight to each individual basis function. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to write out this basis function and that would give me W0 plus the sum i is one to m of w i x i. So we see uh, with such a projection uh, based basis function, I just reobtain my linear regression model. So this doesn't really get us anywhere, but it will get us started on, on the idea of basis functions. Now let's consider the basis functions to be these power maps, these out power maps. So meaning that the i basis function takes x to the power i. Well, what, what would that give us? It would give us, again, this bias term plus w1 times x to the power 1 plus w2 times x to the power 2 plus w3 x to the power 3, etc. So if we choose the basis functions to be these i power maps, um, I get a polynomial regression problem. And I again can formulate this into vector notation, a W transpose scalar product with my uh, basis uh, vector, where this vector was the collection of, of, of these values for the basis function. So phi of x is given by one x, x squared, x to the three, etc. Okay, so let's look at an example. So now my polynomial basis consists of these basis functions. The, uh, the first basis function is just a constant. The second basis function is this uh, linear slope. 
the third will be this quadratic form and then the third this one and now uh, i'm going to define a model i'm going to construct a model by assigning weights to each of these newly obtained feature vector that would give us the function mapping on the right so if i'm going to tune, tune uh, the bias term i will, will will get an offset if i'm going to tune the first component i can add a slope uh, let's move it back and then if i would tune the, the second weight i would add this quadratic term to it so i can make all these linear combinations of these basis function so you see now i'm actually constructing quite complicated functions just by taking linear combinations of uh, what I constructed with these basis functions. Okay, and this is still called linear regression because now I'm going to take linear uh, combinations of my uh, basis functions of these newly obtained feature vectors uh, with some W. So with respect to W, this problem is completely linear. But with respect to X, I now obtain a non-linear mapping from X to my output Y. Uh, so this non-linearity is obtained via a clever choice of what my basis looks like. And in this case, I considered a polynomial basis. So now still this choice for basis function, that's a, cho that's a choice I have to make. It's, uh, we can consider it a hyperparameter. Now I can make many choices and some choices are more suitable uh, for one problem and the others are more suitable for another problem. Um, I'm just going over some examples of basis functions that you encounter uh, quite often. And one of those is the Gaussian basis function, um, it, which consists of Gaussian functions, but without this correcting um, coefficient in front of it, because if I multiply this with the W, this correction factor or this front factor can be absorbed within W, so I'm not going to need that. Uh, so these basis functions look like this. It's these exponential, which have some offset, some mean, so this is a Gaussian blob, this exponential blob centered around some mean, and it has the shape determined by this co covariance matrix. Okay, so I'm considering d-dimensional input vectors, and each basis function takes one of these input vectors and spits out a new number, which can be thought of as proximity towards uh, to this, uh, these mean values. Uh, and these means are really hyperparameters that I pick myself. So I'm going to design a bunch of uh, basis functions that look like this. And then my linear model uh, with respect to W looks like this. So I have again my bias term plus a sum over all these basis functions. I assign a weight to each of these basis function minus a half x minus mu i transpose inverse covariance matrix. Okay, and this looks something like this. Okay, so this is what the basis functions look like now. Again, I have this uh, bias term, so the constant one function, and then I have these shifted uh, uh, Gaussian blobs. And I'm considering the 1D case, right? So in each uh, Gaussian or each exponential is centered around some point. This one is centered around minus three over four. Uh, this one is centered around minus one over four and so on. So I have all these shifted basis functions. And now I'm going to make linear combinations of this. And that's, that allows me to, to construct functions that are more localized. So each basis function only considered a localized region. For example, in this region, I would say an increase with respect to my target value, followed by a decrease, uh, followed by an increase, and maybe an even uh, higher increase. Um, Again, so now I'm going to make linear combinations of my basis function. So it's still a linear regression problem, but uh, with respect to input variable X, the, the, the function Y is highly nonlinear. Okay, so we see that each basis function has its own set of properties. The Gaussians are more localized, but we could also work with, for example, with logistic sigmoid functions. And whereas the Gaussians are really localized, the logistic sigmoid functions can be used to focus on regions like threshold regions. Uh, I'll, I'll give the example in a minute. But these logistic sigmoid functions, they look like this, one over one plus e to the power minus x. Let's consider the 1D case again. And then we can uh, shift these functions with a mu i parameter and we can scale them. Okay, so these logistic sigmoids look like this. Suppose I consider one of these basis functions. It has a particular um, offset point. So these are like smooth indicator functions where, which assign zero to a region below this threshold and one above this threshold. And 
there's this smooth transitioning going on, which can be controlled with a steepness parameter. I can make this transition, uh, transition very smooth, but if I make S very small, then it becomes very steep. I make a very quick transition, and then mu i determines the location of this transition. And you can imagine that these kind of basis functions are ideal for working with stepwise uh, functions, or let's say um, my predicted label is only valid for some region. So let's say the house prices are, <laughs> uh, let, let's put some constant, my house prices are constant, but for some region, all of a sudden, if the square meter goes from, let's say, uh, 100 square meter to 500, I have a constant price. And after that, the houses become cheap again. It's of course uh, completely unrealistic, but <laughs> I couldn't come up with a better example just now. The point is, with these logistic sigmoid functions, we can again generate quite interesting functions simply by taking a linear combinations of these uh, basis functions. So it's a linear model, but the resulting predicted predictive function is uh, highly nonlinear. Okay, so I showed several of these basis functions uh, and basically these are choices that you make in your model. I'm, my choice is to work with a particular type of basis function. So we call, this is a choice that so we call the hyperparameter uh, in some sense. And then each basis function in itself could also consist of several hyperparameters like these offsets and these scales. So we call these things, we call them hyperparameters. Uh, same here, like this, this mu, the location of these uh, Gaussians and uh, their, their, their shapes or the covariance matrix are hyper parameters. And they're called so because they are not automatically set. Like the weights, um, so these weights, they are automatically obtained via some approach, via least squares regression or via uh, maximum a posteriori uh, optimization. But these things, we set them by hands typically. Uh, so that's why we call them hyperparameters. Okay, so we've covered a bunch of uh, different types of basis functions. So we consider polynomials, which look like this. Each height basis function was basically x to the power i. And in this illustration, x is really just one, a one dimensional input. Uh, so that gives me a basis function for the linear slope, for a parabola, for third order, um, like x cubed, uh, and so on. So this gives me a polynomial basis. Then we saw an example of a Gaussian basis functions, which looks like this. So each basis, each i basis function consists of a exponential one over two sigma squared. So that's the, the size or the scale of the Gaussian x minus mu i. And it was centered around some particular uh, centered around some particular mu i. And these basis functions have the property that they're highly localized. So that, that could be a very convenient uh, property uh, to work with. And, and then we had logistic sigmoid functions. So um, where sigma is defined to be the logistic sigmoid, so the smooth indicator function, and it could be scaled with some steepness uh, parameter. So mu i in this case determines uh, the offset, and then uh, s determines the slope of this uh, basis function. Now each class of basis function has its own properties and it's up to you as a designer of such, uh, such machine learning algorithms to, to pick the one that suits your problem best. Okay, so we just went over linear regression models using basis functions. We saw that with such basis function, we could actually uh, generate or construct quite complicated functions just by taking linear combinations of a set of basis functions. Uh, where each basis function was assigned some weight. Uh, what we're going to do in this video, we're going to actually fit these type of functions to data. So we're going to tune the parameters W in an optimal way, and we're going to do this via uh, the maximum likelihood approach. Okay, again, we're considering uh, the following setting. We have input variables, x, i, where each x, y is a d-dimensional vector. And I'm going to predict target values. So the corresponding target values are just uh, some scalar value. Now I'm going to assume that my data is generated through some model. So there exists some y that maps each input x to the true target value. That's it. That is this red curve and the red curve is the thing that we want to reconstruct. That's the thing that we want to fit. And we're going to do that with a linear model using basis functions. 
So that means my output y is given by the scalar product of w with my uh, basis factor. And recall that my uh, my bias is absorbed in this um, weight factor. So that means that my w is given by uh, a bias w0, w1 up to w m minus one, and this gives me an m-dimensional uh, weight factor. And now my um, my basis factor looks like this. It's a vector which takes as input this input vector and stacks, stacks uh, well, the bias uh, basis, so that's the constant one, phi one, the first basis function, which takes as evaluated at this point x, the second basis function evaluated at point x, etc., up to m minus one, basis function. So also this thing is a vector of length m. Okay, so this defines the linear model that we're going to use to, to model this, this behavior that maps the input to the corresponding uh, target uh, values. Okay, so that's denoted over here. This is our model. It's a linear model with basis functions. And then we assume Gaussian noise around the target, right? So we assume there exists such a true model, but then we make measurements. So these blue dots, they're centered around this true model uh, with some noise variance. And this noise variance has precision beta. So we're going to say that the targets in my data are generated via this true model. So Y, which maps an X to the corresponding target, given some model parameters, plus some epsilon noise. And this epsilon noise is assumed to be Gaussian distributed with some inverse precision or some variance uh, on the noise. Okay, now given this uh, probabilistic approach to things, we're going to come up with a predictive distribution that given some x and given my model parameter, uh, returns a probability for each of the corresponding target values. And we're going to model this predictive distribution via a normal distribution. So this normal distribution with respect to the random variable t is centered around a predicted mean. And the predicted mean was given by my uh, linear model. And it has precision uh, beta, right? So this mean over here is given by my model y of x parameterized by w. So my predictive distribution um, maps up an input x to a, per a certain mean and then assumes a Gaussian distribution around that mean. So with highest probability right at the mean, but I still consider points slightly deviating from this and this defines my uh, predictive distribution. Okay, so that's the setting. And then we're working with a, a so-called data matrix. So uh, all my data points are combined into a data matrix. Uh, that's this thing. And it's a matrix of size D by N, right? Because each data point was a vector of length D and I'm going to put them all next to each other and it gives me a matrix of size D by N. And then also have this target vector. So this is a vector of size n because for each end data points or for each data point and I have n of them I have one value that I want to predict. So this predictive distribution really describes the likelihood uh, for each target value given uh, well my model parameters and given my uh, input point given my data set. So and that's what we want to optimize and we assume that the data was iid so identically independent uh, distributed according to this uh, predictive distribution. So that means that the joint likelihood uh, can be factorized into the product of all these individual uh, likelihoods. And that means that I get the product over all my uh, predictive distributions. So all these Gaussians with these front factors, all these Gaussians, So all these Gaussians, which were, which have the same uh, mean, well, of course, for each data point, this mean is slightly different because of this uh, function mapping, uh, y of x, 
and they have the same beta. Okay, so this is the function. This joint uh, likelihood uh, function is the thing that we're going to optimize. And when this is maximized with respect to W, we have obtained uh, the maximum likelihood solution for my uh, model. Okay, so that's summarized over here. I have this likelihood, which is really the predictive distribution evaluated at each of my data points. So that tells me like, that gives me really the likelihood um, of all this data being generated by this model parameterized by this W and this beta. And we're going to optimize it uh, via the log likelihood. So let's write this out. We're going to take the log of the likelihood. The likelihood was given as this. Uh, so we take, uh, remember, if you take the log, then these products become sums. So I have n times this factor over here. Uh, this is beta over 2 pi to the power a half. And powers, they move in front of the log. So uh, that's what we're going to do now. So the front factor splits in n over 2 because I have n times this term times log of beta minus n over 2, the log of 2 pi. So that's the front factor. And then I have the product of all these exponentials. So that becomes the sum of the log of these exponentials. So that term gives me minus beta over 2, the sum of ti minus Okay, so we see when we maximize uh, the, the log likelihood, we're going to maximize uh, this thing over here with respect to W. This doesn't depend on W. So if we formulate this as a minimization problem, then it, I can write it as the solution is obtained by minimizing the sum over all n of Ti minus W transpose phi xy um, and this thing squared. So this gives me the sum of squared errors. Okay, so if I minimize the sum of squared errors with respect to W, I obtain the maximum likelihood solution for W. Uh, but now let's just think of this thing as an error, as something that I want to report or look at. What is the error of my model, right? It's the sum of squares errors. Now, this thing, um, in that, that perspective, it's maybe a bit an odd thing because if my number of data points increases, this error automatically uh, will increase because, well, I'm quite likely to make at least some errors. So if I consider more and more data points, my error will increase, whereas my model will could still be a good fit. So there's, uh, well, two things we want to do actually. Well, first of all, we want to normalize this thing then. So instead of one over two, we said one over N, such that at least this thing doesn't change too much when I add more uh, data points. Okay, so that's nice. So now at least if I have more data points, uh, my average error, uh, well, it will, it will be an average error, so it won't change uh, too much. Um, but then this is the sum or the, the average, the mean squared error. So I take the square of an error and usually it's convenient to stick with the same units. Um, let's say I'm predicting uh, meters, then I have an error on the meter and I'm going to square that error. So that gives me a squared meter error. And that's an odd thing. So we want to stick with the same units and that's why we um, usually take the square root of this thing. So that gives me the root mean squared error. And this is an error metric that doesn't change much with uh, the number of data points. Obviously it changes because now if I add more data points, I make different uh, errors. And also the error that I report has the same scale or the same units as the target that I'm predicting. So this is a, a sensible thing to, to work with actually. So when people report errors, uh, they typically report the root mean squared error. So what does it look like? Uh, so these are my data points. I have uh, a model, I have a data point, so I can evaluate this model at all the data points. And for each data point, I will make some error, right? And in the likelihood optimization approach, we were actually minimizing the sum of squared errors. So we take a look at all these errors, square them and take the sum. And that's our object objective, which we're going to minimize. Okay, now let's actually minimize the sum of squared errors. Let's find the W that really provides the, the minimal sum of squared errors or equiv equivalently that maximizes 
the log likelihood. So we're going to find an so we're going to find an analytic solution for W for which the log likelihood is maximized. And remember that um, if you're interested in optimal values uh, with respect to some par parameter, then uh, this means that the gradient with respect to this parameter of the function that you're optimizing is zero, right? So suppose we have this energy landscape or this error function, it's called F of W. We know that at these optimal locations, at these optimal locations, we have that the gradient with respect to W is zero. Okay, so this is a necessary condition for an optimal value. And we're now looking for such an optimal value. Now the second thing to observe is uh, that our error term here with respect to W, it's a quadratic form. So it really this thing is what we call a convex uh, function, a convex error term. Where convex means that in, in, let's say in a 1D case, it looks something like this. And it, it basically means that we only have one optimal value. So that means if we're able to find a W that satisfies this criteria, that satisfies the gradient with respect to W of my error is zero. If we find such a W, then we have find the global optimal. And we find the global optimal then because our error is a convex function. Okay, so let's actually do that. Let's take the derivative with respect to W of the thing that I'm optimizing and set it to zero. Now the challenge in this case is that we're dealing with a, a vector valued uh, variable. So W is a vector and what does it mean to take the derivative with respect to a vector? Um, so we're, we're moving towards this uh, multivariate case. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do this. And really this is going to be an example for how to compute analytically the solution for W um, in this multivariate setting, um, taking maximum likelihood as an example, because later in the, the assignments you will do the same or similar thing for the maximum a posteriori approach. So uh, pay attention, this, this example is really to get you familiar with working with in this vector valued uh, setting. Okay, so we're going to compute the derivative with respect to a vector. And we define it to be as follows. So we say that if I take the derivative of a, a could be our error function, with respect to a vector, it's going to be the derivative with respect to the first component in this vector, then the derivative with respect to the second component of this vector. And this would give me a row vector. And this is really a convention that we use. So we say that the, the, the vector derivative gives us a row vector. And actually we may even denote this with this gradient symbol, we say the gradient of A is defined as this derivative. And we say that the gradient is a row vector. And this may conflict with what you're used to uh, for gradients being. Uh, usually you would say the gradient is a vector. Uh, well, we say it is a row vector. So that's really our definition now. And um, it's for us, it's a convenient way of defining the gradient and the derivative, um, especially in this multivariate case, as we will see maybe in, later on when we work with chain rules of matrix vector multiplications. But for now, it's, it's sufficient to remember that we define the gradient with respect to a vector as this thing over here. Okay, so that's what we're going to, to do. We're going to take the derivative with respect to W of our error uh, function over here, and then we're going to set it to zero. And now let's start off by, let's make it a bit easier for ourselves. Let's use a change of variables. So let's say we call this thing u. So u is ti minus w transpose phi xi. Right, so, so let's write this out. Um, so really, um, doing a change of variables. So I still have this minus beta over two, i is one to n t du of u squared du dw. Okay, so let's write that out. So that's really the same front vector minus beta over two, the sum i is one to n of uh, this derivative, which was two u, so two times t y minus W transpose phi of x i. And this 
times du dw. So times du dw. Okay, so let's compute this thing. So du dw means I'm going to compute um, the derivative of this thing. So this part doesn't depend on w, so I'm going to take the derivative of this thing. So that will be minus d d w of w transpose phi. And now it's getting a bit uh, tricky, right? Because now I'm taking the derivative with respect to a vector. And what I see over here is a row vector. So this isn't truly really compatible. I mean, we could still write it out as this is a scalar product. So this is a sum of w1 times phi1, w2 times phi2, etc. And then we could just apply um, this definition over here. But we're going to do a convenience trick. Uh, so we want to turn this, we want to see the vector w, not the row vector w transpose. And the scalar product, we can switch orders by uh, simply taking the transpose of each of these things. So the derivative here is actually the same as minus d dw of phi xi transpose w. So I really, I just switched the orders and that implies that I have to put a transpose to each of these uh, uh, vectors. And now you see, I'm going to take the derivative of this w and I see a w over here. And we know from uh, differentiation that if we see this item over here, we could just uh, cross it out. So this is really the derivative of this linear uh, thing. So that gives us minus phi xi transpose. Right, so we see that if we take the derivative of this thing over here and we see a phi over here, if we take the derivative, we actually get uh, phi transpose. And please verify this yourself using just the direct application of our, our definition of this derivative and expanding this. Maybe you could do this also by expanding the scalar product into this sum of components. So if you don't believe me, please verify that this is true. Okay, so now we can replace this du dw over there. So let's remove it and write phi of xi transpose. And we had a minus, so this becomes a plus. And remember that what we were doing, we were optimizing this thing. So we computed the gradient with respect to w and this had to be set to zero. And now solving this, would uh, give us the optimal value w. Okay, let's mark this out for a bit. So this was really just helping us with the computations. Okay, so we're solving for the w that satisfies this equation. And that means, uh, so we can rewrite this. Um, this thing has to be zero, so it doesn't depend on beta. Actually, uh, beta is bigger than zero, so we can uh, divide it out and also these um, two terms uh, cancel out. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to move the ti on to the right hand side. So that actually gives me this equation. Right, so this term, what you see over here is this product. So phi with phi transpose and w transpose up front. And I move the sum uh, over there. And this ti part multiplied with phi is moved to the other side. Okay, so this is the thing that we need to solve. Um, now I'm going to write it a little bit further into a slightly more convenient form by taking the transpose uh, on both sides. sides. Okay, so really this gives me the sum i is one to n of phi xi it's phi xi transpose. And this entire thing, the product with w, and this has to be equal to the sum i is one to n ti phi of xi. Okay, so this over here gives us the system that we need to solve. When w satisfies this equation, we have found or globally optimal solution uh, that minimizes uh, 
uh, the error, the, the, the sum of squared errors, or which maximizes the log likelihood. Okay, so that's again repeated over here. This is what we just derived. This is what we need to solve. And to solve this, we're going to move a step further into this fully matrix vector notations. So I'm going to introduce this matrix over here, which is called the design matrix. And it basically consists of all my basis functions, uh, base function 0 to 1 to m minus 1, evaluated for each data point. So each row in this matrix is the feature vector corresponding to, to the first data point, and then the next row is the feature vector corresponding to the next data point, and then I have n of such rows. So this thing is really an n by m matrix. That, that, that really encodes for all these feature transformations for all my data points. Now let's have a quick look at the terms, what we see in the equation that we're solving here. So um, phi is a vector of, of size m, and phi transpose is a row vector. So this thing over here actually would give me an m by m matrix. What do I see on the right hand side? Well, this thing was my vector of length m. So this is a vector of size m. So now with this matrix uh, vector notation in place, we can show that uh, this equation is the same. So now in, with, in terms of capital phi, in terms of our design ma matrix, phi transpose phi times w is phi transpose the t vector so the vector that uh, captures or that encodes for all my uh, target values and you can of course show that this is the same because matrix vector multipl multiplication means i'm multiplying a row with a vector now this is a fixed vector i take in five transpose here so this become a rows and so this was the feature value for the first data point for the second so i'm multiplying the corresponding um, basis function evaluations with corresponding target values. Um, again, this is something that you can easily verify. So please do so if you um, do not have this intuition yet. So now I'm going to do some linear algebra here. I'm going to um, multiply both sides with the inverse of this thing, and that would give me the solution for W, right? So W is given by the inverse of phi transpose phi multiplied, multiplied with phi transpose times t. And this is something that we uh, can easily numerically compute. Uh, and this thing over here, so this thing is called a pseudo inverse or the more Penrose inverse of capital Phi. And it's typically denoted with capital Phi plus, and it has the same properties uh, as an inverse, namely that um, Phi uh, plus, so the pseudo inverse of Phi times Phi gives me the identity matrix. Okay, so really we have, now we have found the optimal, we have found the maximum likelihood solution for our uh, regression problem. And in terms of this matrix vector notation, it was given as follows. Okay, so this gives us the maximum likelihood solution for W, and we can use this W now in our predictive distribution. And if you then want to make uh, a point prediction or like a point estimate for a given input X prime, I can simply take the expected value over this distribution, given my model parameters and my input point X, and the expected value, because we're working with a, a Gaussian uh, distribution with a Gaussian model, this expected value corresponds to the mean, and the mean was described by, uh, via our um, linear regression, via our basis function-based uh, linear regression model. So the mean is given by my weights, my obtained set of weights times the basis functions. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so now we have found a way 
Now we have found a way to compute the optimal value for W and we can numerically implement it. I mean, we have numerical tools for computing the inverses and pseudo inverses. So really given all my data, I can now uh, come up with this nice uh, predictive uh, distribution in this um, basis function based regression model. And this whole exercise was also to give an example or to get you comfortable with working in this matrix vector notation also to get a bit of feeling how does this work with uh, taking derivative taking derivatives of a vector valued uh, variables so now i showed this example and it's up to you to gain some experience uh, and for that we de we designed this uh, assignment in which you're going to redo this but now in the maximum a posteriori case Now we just derived a closed form solution for W. We found a W that solved the least squares regression problem or equivalently the maximum likelihood estimation problem. And essentially we derived a one step algorithm to find the optimal W. Now in this video we're going to present an alternative, more compute friendly approach to obtaining an optimal W. Now I'm interested in a more compute friendly approach because in our direct approach, um, where the, in which a solution is given by this, uh, I need first of all to process all data at once. Uh, and But most importantly, I, I have to compute a matrix inversion of an M by N matrix. So that's this particular matrix over here. And especially taking this inverse is a computationally very demanding task. And this scales, so it, its complexity is in the order of M uh, cubed. Right, so if I pick my number of features, because that was M, M was the number of basis uh, functions. If I let this grow, then the complexity or the compute associated with solving this solution also really uh, grows really rapidly. So generally when we want to find the solution in a direct step, then um, this can be very computationally demanding and also can require quite a lot of memory of your um, system. Then we move on to a more compute efficient approach. Um, we're going to move there by making two observations. First of all, we denote that the total error uh, is, consists of the sum of all these individual errors, right? Because I, I am able to compute this error for each data point individually, and my total error is just the sum of this thing. And so what I'm going to do, instead of computing all these errors at once and solving for the solution, for all my data points at once, I'm going to do it step by step. So I'm going to pick one data point, I'm going to look at the error, I'm going to tune, tune my W parameters a little bit as to minimize the error for this particular data point. Um, okay, change W and then move on to the next data point and tune W again. Okay, and this really leads to the stochastic part of our uh, solution, which I'm going to uh, explain in more detail in the upcoming slides. Uh, so the stochastic part comes from the fact that we're not using with the precise error that we're interested in, but we're going to make an approximation of an error with just a subset of, of data points, or maybe even one data point at a time. Okay, so that's one part of it. And the second part is that we're going to rely on gradient descent as an optimization technique. So the second part is gradient descent, and I'll explain in the next slide um, the principle behind gradient descent. Okay, so the stochastic part refers to um, approximating the total error with less data points and this gradient descent part refers to um, a way for minimizing my error. Okay, so and before I explain the gradient descent, I first want to make some remarks about the gradient, some a recap of, of things known about the gradient. First of all, the gradient encodes for all directional derivatives via the scalar product. And with that I mean, uh, first of all, let's say uh, the derivative of my energy, or of my error with respect to W, is defined to be this derivative with respect to the error and this was defined to be a row vector, right? So the derivative of E with respect to the first component, the derivative with respect to the second component, etc. 
Okay, in our convention, the derivative is a row vector. Then the directional derivative, uh, so let's say I consider some direction in Rm, then the directional derivative is simply given by the scalar product or this row vector multiplication of the, my gradient with uh, my vector. All right, so suppose my energy landscape looks something like this. So this is like a height map, right? A height map of the energy uh, landscape. Now I can compute a gradient. And this gradient is, is this co-vector or this row vector. And if I want to compute the directional derivative, let's say in this direction. So I want to know how much changes the landscape in this direction. So I have some direction vector and I have a gradient of my energy and then um, the derivative in the direction v so how much does my energy landscape changes in the direction of v is given by the product of my gradient with this direction vector and that would give me the change in error along direction v. And recall that in our convention, the gradient is a row vector. So uh, I'm doing really row times vector and that gives me one number and this number represents a change in direction in the direction of v. Okay, um, now another thing is that uh, the gradient is always perpendicular to the contours of a function. So again, let's consider or error function. Now if I compute the gradient of this thing and the lines that I draw over here, those are really the ISO contours. So those are the weights for which my error takes on some constant value. So you can think of this as a height map and each line uh, represents the height of my error and uh, when it becomes smaller I get these different rings and this will be the value the valley which we're interested in right okay so then um, the gradient so that's a property of the gradient the gradient is always perpendicular to these uh, iso contours so the gradient of e is perpendicular to these iso contours and then the, the above two properties together actually give me uh, directly that the gradient always points in the direction of steepest ascent. Right? So again, think of this as a mountain landscape. These are the ISO contours. Then the gradient points me in the direction of the steepest uh, part of the mountain, of, of the ridge where I'm cur currently standing. Okay, and these properties of the gradient also with respect to ISO contours are uh, also discussed in uh, the book of Bishop in Appendix E. Um, and I can imagine that there's plenty of YouTube videos explaining gradient descent. So also take a look at those if, if you want to get more uh, feeling on this. Okay, so moving on. These are some properties of the gradient. Okay, so what we're going to do is gradient descent. So if I have this uh, mountain landscape or this error landscape, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to start at some point so let's say I'm going to start uh, at this point. I'm going to look at the gradient, points in this direction, and the gradient tells me the direction of steepest ascent. So inversely, also the direction of steepest descent. And now I'm just going for, I'm just going downhill, so I'm going to follow uh, the negative uh, gradient direction. So that brings me to the next point. So let's say it's somewhere over here. Then I look at the gradient, and I'm going to move downhill to this point. What is the gradient there? Well, it points in this direction. Okay, and I continue until I reach the lowest point in my uh, landscape. Now, this is the principle behind gradient descent, right? So the idea is I'm going to start with some initial set of uh, parameters for W, let's call it W0. I'm going to update it by going downhill, that gives me W1. I'm going to update it by going downhill in this uh, arrow landscape, that gives me W2. W3, so I have the sequence of new parameters for W where each one is slightly better 
uh, in the sense that it has a lower error associated with it. Okay, now as mentioned before, we're not going to use the full error function. And recall that this error function is really also a function of my data points. So really all my data points together define this full error function. Uh, instead of using all data at once, I'm going to just consider one um, error for one particular data point at a time. So you can imagine that this error, it might look like the, the, the true error, uh, because maybe I make the same mistakes for each data point. Like suppose I do some over uh, estimation for each data point, then each data point would give the same error. Uh, so these things will be very close, but generally each error at each data point will be different. So also if I compute the gradient of this thing, it will not be the precise gradient of my full uh, error, but it will be something that maybe looks like it. So maybe it looks like this. So we can think of this. So this would be then the gradient of W with respect to E, whereas uh, this red one would have been the gradient of W with respect to E D. So the gradient computed on my full data set. Now, if I compute the, the gradient with respect to E, so with only one or a few data points, I would get a noisy estimate. And if I then use this to move downhill, I would move somewhere over here, for example, I compute again, some noisy estimate, again, a noisy estimate, noisy estimate, and so on. Uh, but these estimates are good enough in the sense that, uh, well, in the end, if my update step is small enough, I am I actually have the guarantee that I'll end up uh, converting to the to the global optimal. So my update steps are noisy, but in general uh, they're good enough to, to really make this downhill process. So we're really approaching the global optimum also in this uh, stochastic gradient descent case. So I have these noisy update steps, which are not perfect, but on average, they will get me uh, definitely down, downhill. And this is the principle behind stochastic gradient descent. And it's nice because I only need to evaluate the gradient from one particular data point at a time and update uh, my weight parameters. Okay, so that, uh, so the stochastic gradient descent algorithm is summarized here. So we initialize with the W, choose a learning rate uh, eta, and then we iterate over the data points where we really move in a downhill direction. So let's just write out what this thing uh, says. So we have the previous set of weights and we're going to update it with the gradient of this thing. So really of this thing. And we computed that gradient before. So this is given by ti minus w at iteration tau phi of xi times phi xi. Now we derived the gradient, the gradient of the squared error term before. And I just want to make a remark here that we put a transpose over here because we took the convention that my gradient, that my gradient was a row vector, w is a vector. So actually this thing had to be turned into um, a vector and that's why, why we put this transpose over here. And that's why you don't see the transpose over here, whereas pre previously we had a transpose over there. Okay, so this is all there is to, to it. So this is quite easy to implement. You only need to implement this update rule. So we pick a weight factor. Uh, we have an analytic form of my, uh, of my gradient step. Uh, so which I compute just for one data point. So this is really efficient to compute and I update it and I iterate it. And if my eta, so my step size is small enough or my learning rate is tall in, small enough, I actually have that uh, my gradient descent converges to the global optimum, where it converges to the global optimum because we're considering here a convex optimization problem. We have covered linear regression using basis functions, and we showed how to fit these uh, functions to the data. For example, we could do fitting via maximum likelihood optimization, where we obtain the optimal parameters either in closed form, so in one step, or obtain it via an iterative gradient descent approach. And we saw that we can actually fit quite complex functions to the data using these basis functions. But now there's choices to be made, there's hyperparameters to be set. So what kind of basis functions am I going to use? How many of them? And some choices lead to more reliable models than others. So uh, these choices have consequences. And in this video, we're going to talk a bit about
one of the most important consequences to spot, we're going to talk about overfitting and underfitting. Now consider again this fitting problem where we want to reconstruct this, this green uh, line over here. So it describes some real world phenomenon. Uh, it's in this green, so it's some sine wave, a mapping from X to some target T uh, described by this sign. And what we have are the blue measurements. And now we want to reconstruct uh, what kind of model uh, generated this, uh, these data points, right? So we have a true model which we want to reconstruct and there was some absolute noise that led to these uh, noisy blue uh, measurements. And now we're going to do this with a polynomial basis functions. Uh, so that's the choice that we make, but then still we have a choice of, okay, what order of basis functions we are going to use. We already saw this example before. So in um, the MS0 case, I'm only fitting the, this bias term. So that gives me very poor, uh, a poor model. Um, we go to higher order, we have this linear slope. We go to MS3, so up to uh, cubed powers of X, we're able to actually do a quite good job. And if we go all the way to MS9, we actually have a very noisy fit. It's a perfect fit because it goes precisely to the data points, but this fit doesn't generalize well. Now these effects uh, we call underfitting and overfitting respectively. So on the top left, we have underfitting, meaning that my model is too rigid. It's, it's not flexible enough to really represent the data. So um, what I get is a pretty stable result. So I always uh, approximate a line. So my models always look somewhat the same, uh, but that's it. I don't have very much predictive or expressive power. And what you see at the bottom right is called overfitting. So we're fitting to the data. So we're doing a good job, we're do but basically we're doing a too good job. We're really fitting to the data or to the noise in, in this case. So we get a model that sort of follows the data roughly, but there's a lot of noise to it. And we call this overfitting. So basically my model has too much expressive, expressive power that it can now also spend its expressive power also to fitting to these noise components. Now let's see if we can actually spot this, right? Because now we know um, our, our true signal is this sine wave, um, but of course, in practice, we do not do not know what the ground truth is. We only have these blue measurements, uh, but still we want to make sure that we're not overfitting. We actually want this thing. It generalizes well to new data points, but suppose I don't have these new data points and I want to get a feeling of whether or not I'm overfitting. Um, so we, what we can do, we can actually look at the weights that are obtained um, to obtain these functions. So that's shown over here. So we have these four different models. So in MS0, I'm only going to fit this bias uh, term to it. MS1, I also have this linear uh, slope. So I have all these coefficients and these are the weights uh, that define my model. So let's take a look at MS6. It consists of a bias, a linear, a quadratic and a cubic term. So with these weights, so with these weights, I can construct a function that looks like this. And now when I go to MS9, this overfitting case, I see that these uh, values, they really take on extreme values. So they become very large. Now this is a clear sign of overfitting. Now I'm going to write this down. So uh, this is a clear sign of overfitting. And in a way it's a bit surprising, but in another way, another way not. And what I mean with that is that I have this model MS6, which really, uh, so this set of parameters could also be, have been obtained with this MS9 case. And with this, I mean um, the, the set of basis functions up to order six uh, spans a subspace, a subspace of the MS9 case. So I could also represent, I could also represent this function with MS9 uh, uh, basis functions, but this is not going to happen. And why is this not going to happen? Because we told the machine learning algorithm to minimize uh, the sum of squared errors. So really we want to go precisely to these data points. And in that sense, this model is not good enough because it still makes errors. And in order to go precisely to these data points, I have to really 
uh, crank up the, these weights such that I have sort of momentum going straight through it and up and down. So I have to tune these weights to, to very extreme values to really precisely minimize my, my error function. But actually the best way to, to spot over and underfitting is to really test it on, on real data. So I train my model on training data. And if I want to have a good estimate of how well my model generalizes to unseen data, I, I will just test it on, uh, on test data, on data that the model hasn't seen before, that wasn't used for training, just to get an impression of how well uh, it performs in new, new settings. So that's what we did over here. So we have these models for different orders of the basis function. So zero is only fitting a bias and nine is fitting a polynomial of order nine to the data. Okay, so what we see then focusing on the training data set. So that's the thing that we're actually minimizing in our optimization uh, framework. We see that uh, for the MS0 case, I'm only fitting a bias and we make quite a lot of errors. And if we then increase the flexibility of a model, so going to higher orders, we see this training error decreases, right? So I'm better able to fit uh, to the data. And it decreases in this region only a little bit, slightly, slightly, but then we go to the MS9 case, uh, then my model is flexible enough to really fit precisely to the data and my error drops completely to zero. Now, if we were to have an independent test set, so this wasn't part of the training uh, procedure, I could test how well this model performs in this set. And as to be expected, this, this test error is higher than my train error, right? Because I haven't seen this data before, so okay, it makes sense that, that I'm not as good on, on the real test data that I haven't seen before. So, but we see a similar trend. So if we increase the model complexity, we see my training error decreases, but also my test error uh, decreases. So this means I'm able to use this model in practice. And then we come to a region where we see that it doesn't matter too much which precise uh, order of the basis function I use. So I have a, a good uh, a low test uh, train error, but also a good test error. And then I increase model complexity to the point where, we, where I start to do overfitting. And then I see my test error uh, completely explodes. Right, so if I were to test this really, so I have unseen test data, for example, these points in between, uh, yeah, I'm measuring a lot of error uh, so that, that is what I'm measuring with the test error, testing the performance on unseen data. Now, there's very clear patterns to this, and this is what you can recognize when you work with these two uh, uh, data sets. So on the left-hand side, we have this thing going on. So think about what we see here. We see that both the train error and the test error are quite high. So we see that this model does a poor job, both on the training and the test set. And this is a clear indication of underfitting. Now, the good news is that these train and test errors are quite close to each other. So that means that the train error that I measure and report is quite representative of the true test error. So if I deploy this in practice, I can say with some confidence uh, how well the model will perform in practice. Uh, so in this case, I could say with very clear confidence, with strong confidence that it's going to be doing a terrible job. So at least I can say something about it. Uh, and then we increase the model complexity and then I enter this region and this is beautiful. This is what you want to see. We want to see that the train and the test error is close to each other. So um, the, the, the training error that I measure here is sort of representative of my true test error. And I see that uh, the error is low. So this is a good model. So it's a good model for both on the train and the test set. Then on the right hand side of this plot, something interesting starts to happen again. Now the train error and the test error start to deviate from one another. And this is really important sign that you should watch out for. So this gap that you see over here is called the generalization gap. So it's the gap between the train and test error. And obviously we'll want this generalization gap to be as close, uh, as small as possible, because then it means that my training error is representative of my test error. And we know that my model is going to generalize uh, quite well. Uh, but if it starts to deviate from one another, uh, then I cannot make such statements anymore. And actually this is a super clear sign that we're doing overfitting. Okay, so we see that increasing model complexity by going to a higher order of these basis functions is beneficial for, for my training data, uh, also for the test data, but at some point really I start overfitting and this is a very bad thing. So it doesn't generalize well to new data.
Now, one solution to overfitting, and there's actually many solutions to overfitting, but one solution, very straightforward forward solution, is to just gather more data. And this is, of course, easily said. Uh, in practice, it's maybe some, sometimes hard to, to collect your data. Uh, but in general, in machine learning, you really want as much data as possible. And in this case of overfitting, we see that if we already increase the number of data points to 15, and we're still considering the MS9 uh, polynomial fit case, I actually start to do a better job. And if I go to the NS100 case, I get this actually very uh, beautiful fit. And of course, the reason that I now no longer see this overfitting is because now my model has to make compromises. It cannot just fit through each of these data points anymore because it will make errors anyway. There's too many data points to take into account. So you have to make compromises and that pushes this model to actually come up with a, a reasonable uh, predictive model. Okay, so having more data is a solution to this problem. Uh, but as said, uh, collecting data can be challenging. So what if you do not have all this data available and I still want to prevent overfitting, what should I do? And this is something that we, uh, that we will discuss in the next video. Okay, so we saw that we have control over the complexity of our models by making choices with respect to the basis functions. For example, in the polynomial case, we could uh, decide to work with uh, higher order polynomials, let's say up to order nine, and this allows us to really fit very complex functions. But really uh, working with such a complex model also means that, uh, that it's quite prone to overfitting, and that's something that we want to avoid. Now, instead of manually setting or choosing the optimal order of your basis, for example, we're going to take a slightly different approach we will talk about regularized least squares regression, where we include a regularization parameter. And this parameter, as we will see, puts some control over uh, on the model complexity. Okay, this is, so this is what we saw. We have control over the model complexity by, by changing the order. If I have a very low order uh, model or a very simple basis, then I cannot produce very complex uh, functions. Now, if I increase the number of basis functions, uh, let's say to MS3, I have a more flexible model that now can nicely represent my data. And then if I go to a very high order, uh, let's say MS9, I have a very complex model that can fit all sorts of functions. Uh, so also this very noisy function, which goes precisely do to the data. But we should also remember that this MS9 case should also be capable of uh, fitting this MS3 case because the polynomials up to order x to the power 3 are also included in this set. So it would be possible with this kind of a base set to also fit these kind of functions. Now we saw that this, this isn't happening uh, because my MS9 model, for example, is really putting a lot of emphasis in pushing the error to zero. So it goes precisely to these data points. And in order to do so, uh, my weights has had to take on very large values. And this is something that we want to prevent. So we want to prevent large values because this basically implies overfitting. Okay, so with these observations in mind, let, let's just make a heuristic choice. Let's say instead of, so instead of manually constraining the number of parameters for small data sets, because overfitting occurs when I have little data and I can choose the number of parameters, the number of basis functions. So instead of manually choosing an optimal set of the basis functions, let's just say I'm going to work with this high order model because it can represent a lot of functions. So also the nice ones. And I'm just going to add a penalty term, a penalty term that suppresses these large values. So that prevents uh, all these weights to, be, to, to take on these large values. So let's do that. So let's add an extra term. So lambda over to the sum over all my weights of wi squared. So I'm going to put a squared penalty on, on the weights because if my weights are very large, this means a large penalty. So I should, uh, by reducing w, I can reduce this error by quite a, quite, quite a bit. So introducing this extra penalty term will lead to uh, solutions that have low values for W because if they were large, then I would have a large error and well, uh, we are minimizing this thing. Now, this is something that people uh, quite often do as a regularization term, and this is called rich regression. 
where this thing is, uh, is called the rich penalty term. Now in practice, this bias term is often not included in these regularization uh, penalties because uh, the role of the bias is precisely to allow for shifts in my predictions. Uh, so W0, uh, you want to have this option that this bias is different than zero to allow for the shift. Uh, but another reason is that this bias term doesn't really add to model complexity. It's just a straight line and it doesn't make my model more complex. So we have So we have that the bias is not included in regularization because its role is precisely to allow for offsets, but also it doesn't really add to model complexity. Now we've seen this type of error before, right? So we, we are minimizing here a sum of squared errors and we're putting a quadratic penalty on the weights. Now where have we seen this thing before? Precisely, it was in the maximum a posteriori approach for um, estimating the parameters for W. So this is what we uh, what we just heuristically derived. So we said we're minimizing the sum of squared errors and we're just going to add this quadratic penalty to it and we're going to weight this penalty with some lambda parameter. So if lambda is very high, I put a lot of penalty on high weights, on large weights. And if it's zero, basically, then I'm back to my original uh, least squares regression problem. Now we saw the same uh, error actually arising in the, the map case where we want to maximize the posterior distribution for the weights. So let's have a quick recap of, of what this looked like and how, this, uh, how we obtained this uh, regularized least squares problem in this setting. So we first know that we're optimizing or maximizing the, the posterior distribution for W given my data and some hyperparameter. Now this posterior was obtained via Bayes rule. And base rule says that my posterior is obtained via the product of the likelihood of the data uh, being explained by my model, which is parameterized by a set of W, times the prior for my uh, weights uh, W. And this was then normalized uh, via the evidence for the data. Now remember that this prior encodes my prior belief of the weights taking on certain values. And often we take this prior belief to be normally distributed, so we say my model parameters w, I expect them to be close to zero, so my Gaussian distribution has a mean zero, and I allow it to deviate from zero with some uncertainty, that's my uh, precision parameter alpha. So alpha is a hyperparameter that describes the width of this distribution and basically says how certain I am that the weights will be close to zero. Okay, so let's write this out. We're maximizing uh, the posterior with respect to W and we might as well take the logarithm of it because it doesn't change uh, the location of this optimal value, but it does make our computations a lot easier. So we're actually minimizing the negative log of this uh, um, uh, posterior distribution. Now, uh, the rules of logarithm tell us that this product uh, splits into a sum. So actually we're minimizing uh, well, the negative likelihood and the negative uh, log prior. And this evidence doesn't depend on W, so it isn't part of this uh, minimization uh, uh, framework. Now, this likelihood so far, we always model to be uh, a normal distribution. Uh, so these normals are exponential, e to the power minus, and then some uh, one over to the precision parameter, etc. Uh, so let's just write this out. So if I take the logarithm of this, I only take the part in this exponential. where we modeled uh, the mean of this uh, predictive distribution to be modeled with this, this, pro, this, this model uh, y, uh, which maps an x to a corresponding target value parameterized by a set of weights. So that was the type of models that we were deriving with this likelihood uh, optimization approach. And then we have a beta parameter which, which puts some uncertainty on my predictive distribution. And this beta relates to the uncertainty, my measurement noise basically. And now my prior is also uh, assumed to be normal, normally distributed. So it has this uh, front factor. Let's just write C e to the power minus precision over to uh, W transpose W uh, because my, my mean was zero. So this is what my prior looks like. And if I take the log of it, I obtain that I have plus alpha over to W transpose W. Okay, so this already looks a lot like the error that we heuristically decided to, to minimize. Uh, 
uh, we see that we have a similar problem over here. And we can actually write it precisely in this form by noting that uh, my beta parameter is bigger than zero, so I can divide this. And that actually puts it in the right form. Okay, so we see that it is the same for the case. So it is the same uh, when lambda is alpha over beta. And now let's think again about what these alphas and betas meant. So this alpha was my uncertainty on the weights and beta was basically the precision of my model and it was inversely, inversely proportional to my measurement noise. So this means that if I take a large alpha, so when I take a large alpha, I have a high precision in my uh, prior. So I'm pretty sure, certain that my model is uh, has uh, weights uh, centered around zero. So I'm pretty certain that my weights are going to be zero. And so if I let alpha to be very large, then I'm cranking up this lambda term over here and let this penalty dominate. So I really make sure that my model has low uh, W uh, values. But then the, the other way around, if I say, uh, my predictive distribution have a, have a high precision, so a large beta value. Basically, I say, I'm pretty sure that my model is correct. I do not assume much noise anymore. My model is correct. So my beta will start to dominate and push this lambda value uh, to zero. So that means this uh, regularization term will be pushed to zero and then my data dominates. Okay, so that's a bit how we could think about uh, these parameters. Uh, the main point is here that we have a data term and a penalty term, and we have some parameter that balances the two, and it can be summarized with one uh, lambda value. Okay, so let's see what this actually does. So I'm considering the MS9 case, so this very flexible polynomial, and if I set lambda to zero, I'm basically doing a maximum likelihood optimization. Uh, so I'm just fitting the least squares a solution uh, to my data, and that gives me this a very flexible function, which probably doesn't generalize well. You can see that with, it doesn't match with the ground truth. Now, if I set lambda to larger values, and we're working here with a logarithmic scale, uh, so if I set lambda higher, then I see I'm suppressing these oscillations, I'm suppressing these large values, and actually see I obtain a very nice and smooth function. And now if I increase lambda more and more and more, then I'm suppressing more of these weights, so all my weights are pushed to zero and I end up really with a constant zero in the end. So that's what I see here. Right, so in, in the top case we have no regularization. At the bottom left I uh, suppress my weights just enough. And in this case, I actually have um, too much actually have too much regularization. Now let's again quantify what we're doing here. Let's, let's again quantify how well our models are performing under these. 